Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. The Black Museum. Affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. In a sanctum mystery. Lights out. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar and this is Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Here I have the privilege of bringing you some of the best dark, creepy, and macabre old-time radio shows ever created. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, sign up for my free newsletter, connect with me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, visit other podcasts that I produce. You can also visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the realm of your imagination and that of the greatest horror story writer the world has known, Edgar Allan Poe. Yes, I said the greatest horror story writer because although others may have written stories equally macabre and terror-ridden, no one has written as many. Moreover, when it comes to sheer mystery, puzzlement, Poe is unsurpassed as witness. But, Monsieur Dupin, the door was locked from the inside. The windows were locked from the inside. The murder scene in the Lespanet apartment is on the fourth floor. The murderer could not have escaped. And yet he did, my friend. But how? Oh, Gampierre, you know as well as I do how. I know. You do. <laughs> Your trouble is, you don't know you know. Riddles, Monsieur Dupin, you speak in riddles. Not at all, my friend. You create riddles where riddles do not exist. <laughs> mystery drama, The Murders in the Rue Morgue, was adapted especially for the Mystery Theater from the Edgar Allan Poe classic by George Lothar and stars Paul Hecht. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Make yourselves comfortable. Turn down the lights and listen to one of the most horrifying and mystifying of stories. Edgar Allan Poe's The Murders in the Rue Morgue. The year is 1840. The place, Paris, France. At about seven o'clock in the evening, a young off-duty gendarme, Pierre Musset, and his sweetheart Yvette are returning to her apartment in the Rue Morgue after an evening at the Moulin Rouge. When, when, my darling, shall we be married? Oh, just as soon as I'm promoted to gendarme first class, Yvette. When will that be? Oh, when indeed. 
My sergeant, Duchamp, is one of the most indifferent, ruthless of sergeants who takes pleasure in holding his men back, doing all he can to prevent promotion rather than... Uh, Yvette, look. There's a crowd in front of your house. Something's wrong. Come here, quickly. All right. All right, let me through. Uh, I'm a gendarme. Uh, you, uh, you there, uh, what's, what's happened? We do not know. It happened less than a minute ago. Screams, officer. The most awful screams from Madame L'Espinay's apartment. Madame L'Espinay? Her daughter Camille? Yvette, this is you. Oh. Yes, Camille too. Both of them screaming so horribly in such agony. I cannot tell Where you. Where is the L'Espinay apartment? What floor? N- next to mine. Fourth floor back. Yvette, you stay here. I'll see what happens. No, no, I'll come with stay you. Stay here, I tell you. God knows what I'll find up there. No, Pierre, they were my friends. Oh, well, all right, all right. Come on, then. Is this the apartment? Yes. Hmm, all is quiet. Too quiet. Yeah. The door is locked. Break it in. All right. Uh. So, now let's have a look. Pierre. Oh, my God. Uh, Yvette. No. No. I won't faint. I'll I'll be all right. But, oh, heaven, help us. What has happened here? Look, look, the woman on the floor, her throat cut. Is that Madame Espinay? Yes. Uh, But her daughter, Camille, where is she? The bathroom door. It's closed. Perhaps... I'll go and see. No, it's empty. The, the kitchen, then. Uh, it's the only other room. No. Now there's no one in the kitchen. But where can she be? The door was bolted on the inside. The windows. They're closed. Yes, but... Uh, this one's locked. Look, it's nailed shut. You see, see the nail? The window next to it is nailed shut, too. And anyhow, it's a sheer four-story fall to the yard below. Camille couldn't have left that way. Oh, Pierre! Pierre! Be calm, Yvette. We must both be calm. In the face of this? Oh, poor madame. Her throat cut. Look, look here. Now, this is strange. A bag of gold pieces. Napoleon strewed all over the floor. Oh, that perhaps... Perhaps the murderer heard us coming and hurried to make his escape before... What escape? How could he escape? The door is bolted on the inside. The two windows, the only windows in this apartment, nailed shut. How could he leave? How could Camille leave? Impossible. It's just impossible. It makes no sense. Here. Give me a hand. Get this poor old lady off the floor, onto the bed. Yes. Yes. You, You take her by the feet. I'll lift her by the shoulders. Ready? Yes. All right. Now, lift. Oh, Oh, good Lord. Pierre. Her head. It fell off. Don't faint, Yvette. Don't faint. Oh, no. Look, I must get a message to headquarters at once. You take it while I remain here and... Wait. What, Pierre? The fireplace. See there? A lot of soot has been dislodged. Fallen down from inside the chimney. What would that mean? There's only one way to find out, and that is to get down on my hands and knees and look up into the chimney. <gasps> what? what is it? I am looking into a woman's face. A dead woman's face. Her face? It must be Camille. She, she, she's been stuffed up the chimney, head down. Pierre? What? I'm sorry. I can't help it. I'm going to faint. Jules? Another glass of wine? I'll tell you, Yvette. After what happened next door to you last night, I could use another bottle of wine. You sailors all alike... You can never get enough of wine. Oh, love, come here to me. (laughs) Sure, not now. I'm engaged. Yeah, to a gendarme. And second class yet. He'll be a gendarme first class someday. Yes, and a sergeant someday, too. He... 
Sure. Let me go. I must answer the door. Pierre, darling. I wasn't expecting you. Yes, so I see. Oh, don't get any ideas, Pierre. This is Jules Dubourg. He's a sailor on sick leave. Sure, this is Pierre Musset, my fiancé. Hello. How long have you two known each other without my knowing? A few days. Jules only came to live here a few days ago. Live here? He has two rooms in the basement, and he is quite sick. Something I picked up on my last voyage in Borneo. Borneo, eh? Jules had been all around the world, and more than once. Thank you for the wine, Yvette. It has uh, warmed my stomach. Goodbye for now. Goodbye. I hope that is all you warmed, his stomach. Pierre, what a thing to say. You have no cause to be jealous. I'd better not have. I have enough troubles as it is. Tell me, my darling, what happened when you talked to Sergeant Duchamp? Exactly what I expected would happen. I said, Sergeant Duchamp, I would like to be assigned to this case, to the murders that happened in the Rue Morgue. And what did he say? He said, you... You solve a mystery like that one, you leave such things to your betters in the detective bureau. Of course you stood up to him. Oh, yes, I'm not afraid of him. Not like the others. I argued with him. I explained that I'm in love with the most beautiful girl in the world <laughs> oh, and yeah. that I cannot wait to make her my wife. But I cannot make her my wife until I am promoted to gendarme first class. And one way to get promoted to gendarme first class would be for me to solve the murders in the Rue Morgue. And what did he say to that? He laughed. You are a nut, he said. You are as much of a nut as C. Auguste Dupin. C. Auguste? Dupin. Who is this Monsieur Dupin? The fellow who solved the Marie Rosé case. He is not a policeman. He's only a private citizen with a gift for solving mysteries that others can't solve. Oh. Anyhow, that's what I think, even if everybody else at headquarters doesn't. But if he solved the Marie Rosé case... They say it was an accident. Huh, that case... It was as much of a mystifying puzzle, an unsolvable riddle as this one. And he explained it so simply, you wouldn't believe it. He'll never be able to explain what happened in the Les Panay place next door last night. No one could. Uh, you may be right. <clears throat> Especially now that we know there were two murderers, not one. Two murderers? Then you don't know? No. Yvette, I talked last night with some people in the crowd downstairs. They said that while Madame and her daughter were screaming, they heard the voices of two men yelling and cursing at them. One murderer or two. How did they get out of that apartment? Perhaps your friend, Monsieur Dupin, could tell you. Go to him. Ask for his help. You forget. My sergeant has ordered me to leave everything to the detective bureau. You forget that unless you are promoted to gendarme first class, we cannot marry. One day I shall become One gendarme. day? What one day? When? Jules Dubourg would marry me like that. That sailor? That sick sailor? You would marry him? It would be better than not marrying you. Oh, Yvette, please. You do as I say. Pierre, either you go, or here, take back your ring. Keep the ring. I'll go. Pierre? Pierre? Yvette! What are you doing here in Montmartre? I, I had to see you. This couldn't wait. Pierre, I found this shoved under the door of my apartment. Huh. Looks like a note. It is a note. Read it. Be warned. Tell your boyfriend to forget about the Rue Morgue murders... Or you will die the way Madame Lespinay did. Yvette. I thought you had better see this and take it to Monsieur Dupin at once. He will know what to do. Ah, uh, uh, yes. Yes, he would. Then take it to him as soon as you are off duty. And Pierre? Yes? You, you did go to see Monsieur Dupin, didn't you? Well, well, no. Yeah. I couldn't bring myself to do it. I, I didn't have the nerve. But now... Well, now that your life is threatened, I'll go to see him and ask his help. I promise you, Yvette. I promise. Yes? Uh, Monsieur Dupin? C. Auguste Dupin? Yes? I... I am Pierre Mousset. 
Gendarme, second class, Pierre Bouzet. Ah, yes. You wish my help in solving the murders in the Rue Morgue, is it not so? You know why I'm here? Of course. But how? Oh, you were the first policeman to reach the scene of the crime. You are a second-class gendarme, and helping to solve the murders would result in a promotion. And inasmuch as you yearn to marry a very beautiful young woman named Yvette... Well, that's amazing. That you should know all this without our ever having met? Amazing. <laughs> it's anything but amazing, my friend. It's simplicity itself. Everything I've just told you was fully reported in the newspapers. Oh. Now then, won't you come in? And so what was to Pierre an amazing deduction turns out to be no deduction at all. Nor does C. Auguste Dupin turn out to be the formidable man Pierre thought he would be. As to whether Dupin can bring our two lovers happily together in marriage by solving the apparently insoluble mystery of the murders in the Rue Morgue, we shall see when I return shortly for Act Two. Well then, uh, gendarme second class Pierre Musset has sought the help of C. Auguste Dupin in solving the murders in the Rue Morgue. Murder so baffling that any chance of solving the mystery seems impossible. Still in all, as you know, Dupin solved a mystery equally as puzzling, that of Marie Roger. So let's join Pierre now as he sits across from Monsieur Dupin in the latter's modest apartment. My dear fellow, I have little, if any, interest in solving crimes. I wish only to be left alone to read my books and pursue one or two hobbies. And after all, crime is the business of the police. I know, I know. Well, thank you for seeing me at least. I... I'm sorry to have taken your time. Good day, Monsieur Dupin. Good day. Uh, no. Uh, wait. Monsieur? Uh, I'm a fool, but I'm also French. I have no interest at all in solving crimes, but uh, well, let me face it, I cannot remain untouched by the plight of young lovers. Uh, then you will help if me to... If you solve this mystery, or more precisely, if I solve it for you and let you take the credit, then assuredly you'll be raised to gendarme first class and able to marry your beloved Yvette. Now, can you gain access to the Lispanet apartment? Of course. Well, in that case, my dear fellow, let us go at once to the Rue Morgue. The door is unlocked, yeah? <laughs> yes. As you can see, Monsieur Dupin, it was bolted on the inside when I broke the door. The bolt was torn out of the wood. <laughs> Small wonder. You're a big fellow. Ah, there. That large blood stain on the rug. And that's where she lay. Madame Lespanet, with her head cut off. Hmm. Now, the bag of gold pieces... It lay right here, on the rug. The gold pieces were strewn all over the floor. You know, I keep asking myself, why didn't the two murderers take the gold? But there is no answer. Because you're asking yourself the wrong question. The wrong question? Well, the answer to why they didn't take the gold is simple. They didn't want it. The question you should be asking is, why didn't they want it? Oh, yes. Yes, I see. Now... This is the fireplace where you found the body of the daughter, Camille? Yes. Stuffed up the chimney. Feet first. The head down. Again, I keep asking, how powerful must these men have been to be able to do it? To stuff a body up a chimney with such force that... Well, I don't know how many bones were broken. My friend, you have a positive genius for asking the wrong questions. Again, it's not how they do it, but why did they do it? What reason would they have for doing it? Oh, I can't answer that. Maybe there was no reason. There's always a reason, Pierre. Now, what else was there? Ah, yes, the windows. You say these are the only two windows in the apartment? The only two. None in the bathroom, no. in the kitchen? None. Mm, and these appear to be kept locked with a nail in each. Mm -hmm. And let's see... 
I pulled the nail out of this one and opened the window. Hmm. Well, the murderers couldn't have escaped this way. Even if the windows had been open, it's a sheer drop. Four stories to the ground. Mm, so I see. I also see a drain pipe. But if the windows were locked... They could not have been locked. But they were. Oh, my friend. God also gave you a brain. As with your eyes, use it. You know the murderers did not escape by way of the door. It was bolted on the inside and you broke it in. True enough. They could not have escaped by way of the chimney. It follows that they had to escape via the windows using the drain pipe to reach the ground. But I tell you, the windows were locked, just as they are locked now, each with a long nail. All the windows in this house are the same. A hole is bored through the window and into the sill. To lock the window, you push a nail through it into the sill. Well, you just pull that nail out of this one. <laughs> not, not the other. You do that, my friend. You pull the nail out of the second window. What for? To answer the question of how the murderers escape. Now, do as I say. Uh, Pull it out. Uh, what in the world is... You see? A broken nail. Huh. As simple as that. A broken nail. Ah, but it's not simple. The window only appeared to be locked. Well, I've seen enough. Let's go. You have the answer then, huh, Monsieur Dupin? Well, part of the answer. Only part. But uh, give me time to think and... Uh... Oh, look who's coming up the stairs. I don't care. What are you doing up here? Why don't you stay in your cellar, Jules? That is not your business. Yvette is my business and you are up here to see her. What if I am? I want you to stay away from her. Yvette is my fiancé. Take a reef in your sail, Pierre. You don't own her. Now you listen to me. You take your hands off me. Take them off. Oh, gentlemen, gentlemen. What is all this? What's going on here? I want Jules Dubourg to stay away from you and you from him. Oh, you do? Yes, I do, Yvette. You are my fiancée. But not your wife. And even if I were, I have a right to see anyone I please. Not while you are engaged to me. Oh, is that so? Well, let me tell you something. I will see anyone I wish... Whenever I wish. Oh, now, now, mademoiselle, you don't mean that. You're speaking out of anger. Who are you? And what right have you to interfere? My name is Dupin. Auguste Dupin. <gasps> Monsieur Dupin. Pierre, you went to him. He did indeed, mademoiselle. And believe me, your fiancé is not only a man of determination, but uh, brilliance, mademoiselle. Brilliance? But, my dear fellow, the way you solved the puzzle of that locked window, brilliant, positively brilliant. You'll be in the detective bureau before you know it. Oh, Pierre, that's wonderful, wonderful. Jules, Jules, I think it would be better if you do not come to see me anymore. But, Yvette... Please, Jules, no more. Uh, have it your way. There are other ports of call. Oh, so there, monsieur. Uh, monsieur Dupin, can I offer you a glass of wine? Uh, thank you, but uh, another time. Uh, you, um, you could tell me what perfume that is you're wearing. Nuit de passion. Hmm, passionate night. <laughs> it's well named, mademoiselle. Uh, a pleasure meeting you, mademoiselle. Uh, Pierre, if... Uh, you would see me down to the street? Oh, of course. But come back, Pierre. If you are off duty, that is. I am off duty, Yvette. And I shall be back. Uh, this fellow, Pierre, this uh, Gilles de Bourg, he's a sailor, isn't he? Yes. What's he doing here? Why isn't he at sea? I don't know. He's ill. Some sort of rare tropical disease he picked up in Borneo. In Borneo? Hmm. Interesting. What's so interesting about it? You know, my friend, I told your fiancé you were brilliant enough to be a detective. Oh, I appreciate that, Monsieur Dupin. You did me such a favor of building me up in her eyes. Oh, but it's true, you know. You could be a detective. You only to learn how to use your head and all your senses. My senses? All five of them. You see, everyone's senses, taste, smell, sight, sound, touch, all these tell things. But few people listen. Uh, for example, I noticed the scent of your fiancé's perfume. Have you? Well, 
I've always known she smelled exciting. Mm, but uh, beyond that, you did not go. Now, you ask me why the fact that our sailor man, Gilles Dubourg, contracted the disease in Borneo is interesting to me. Yes, I do, I do. But you've no need to ask. It's as I said before. You know, but you don't know you know. Very well, then. I'll give you a lesson. Your first lesson in how to be a detective. Now, first, look. Then, see what you look at. Then, put two and two together and make sure they add up to four. Now, for instance, put Gilles Dubourg together with drain pipes and see where it leads you. <laughs> Gilles and drain pipes? I don't understand. You will. You will if only you think, my friend. Think. Stay a little while longer. Just a little while. No, my darling. I must go to work in the morning. Oh, I need my sleep. Mm. <laughs> and I'm certainly not getting any with you. <laughs> Must be that perfume you wear. Oh, my perfume, not me. Oh, of course it's you. <laughs> well, whether my perfume or me, off with you. All right. All right. Who will you be seeing, Monsieur Dupin, again? Oh, I don't know. He said he wanted time to think that he would leave a message for me at headquarters. But you know, that I'm beginning to wonder if I if I need Dupin, if there was any need to go to him in the first place. What do you mean? Well, after all, I solved the mystery of how the murderers escaped. One of those two windows wasn't locked at all. The nail was broken. Brilliant. Mm. The murderers must have got to the ground by the drain pipe. The drain pipe. Oh, y yes, yes, the drain pipe. But even so, I've been thinking. No ordinary man could manage to slide down a drain pipe. He would have to be very strong. Yes, and, and, and agile. But you've thought of that, I'm sure. Hmm? Oh, of course. Uh, of course. Well, it's only a question of what kind of man would that be? Oh, I could think of any number. You can? But of course. A chimney sweep for one. A house painter for another. A circus performer. Huh? You know, an aerial artiste. A sailor, like Jules de Bourg, say. They are used to climbing things. Yes. Yes, that is a possibility. Jules de Bourg, a definite possibility. Now, 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 you let jealousy blind you. Jules is a sick man, for one thing, and doesn't have the strength. Anywhere near the strength to do what... what was done in that apartment. Whoever committed those horrible murders was more than strong... He was powerful, unbelievably powerful. Oh, but come now, you you must go. You must. I'm going, I'm going. Lock yourself in. Don't worry, I will. I'm not taking any chances. Not after getting that note. Mm. Yvette, you have nothing to fear. Dupin and I are working on this case and trust us to solve it in short order. I do trust you, my darling. Oh, I do. Mm. Good night, my sweet. Good night. Good night. Good night, my lovely wife to be. Good night. Bolt the door. I was about to. There. It's bolted. Good night, Pierre. Oh. Oh. Yvette. Oh. oh my God. Oh. Yvette. Oh. It's bolted oh. on the inside. Oh, Pierre. Help me. Oh. Yvette. Oh. Help me. that struck Madame L'Espanay and her daughter now strikes Yvette. And once again, Pierre faces the barrier of a door bolted on the inside. You, like me, can imagine the terror of this young policeman as he steps back before flinging all his weight at that locked door, wondering what frightful sight will meet his gaze when he breaks it down. I'll return shortly for Act Three. This is WBBM, Chicago, News Radio 78. 39 degrees at Midway, it's 11.05. 
What frightful monster haunts the Rue Morgue? What kind of fiend committed the butcheries on Madame L'Espagne and her daughter Camille? These are the questions young gendarme Pierre Musset has been seeking to answer. Now it seems he's about to find those answers in the most horrible way imaginable. For behind the bolted door of her apartment in the Rue Morgue, his fiancée Yvette is herself in the grip of the fiend. Oh, Lord, Lord, help me! It's dark, dark, the lamp. Where's the lamp? What? Here, wait! Oh! Oh, oh, my stomach. Uh, Yvette. Yvette. Where's that lamp? Light lamp. There. Yvette. Heaven help us all. Yvette. My friend... Compose yourself. Monsieur Dupin. There now, softly, softly. And tell me all about it. Well, as I said, I broke the door in. It was dark, but I could make out a shape. It was a huge, a a monstrous man against the moonlit window. I I saw him only for a second because he flung himself at me with such speed, with such... Amazing speed. He took me off balance. He struck me. Powerful blow in the stomach. Oh, heaven, I, I'm not yet recovered from it. Uh, some wine, perhaps? No, 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 thanks. Uh, let me go on. Now, as I went down, I, I grabbed at him, and here, look, I, I must have grabbed him by the hair on his head because I, I pulled these hairs out. Hmm. <laughs> Black. Coarse. And then I, I, I think I... I don't know. I, I lit a lamp. Yes, and I saw Yvette. Oh, my poor Yvette. Blood streaming down her cheek. Bruises already beginning to blacken her face. You took her to the hospital, yes. you said. Yes, I, I, I did. What is her condition? Well, it's not fatal, thank God. Not even very serious. Badly bruised, uh, cut over her right eye, but she's going to be all right. The monster failed to make good his threat to kill her. We may indeed thank God for that. Well, at least we know more than we did before, Monsieur Dupin. We know that the murderer is a big man, a huge man of unbelievable strength, and that he has black hair. We know a great deal more than that, Pierre. We do? Well, I do, and so do you. Only, as I've said before... You don't know you know. Oh, monsieur. Monsieur, I do not have your brilliant brain. Well, it doesn't matter. All that matters is that you can solve this awful mystery, that you can save Yvette. The murderer failed this time, but he'll try again. Well, it's my hope that he will, yes. Your hope? Surely you, as much as I, want to save Yvette's life. Not of a certainty, my friend. But I'm afraid I can save it. Only by risking it. Yvette, you're sure you're comfortable on the couch? Yes, Pierre. Thank you. Uh, Mademoiselle, are you strong enough to help me in a plan I have in mind? Now, wait. What kind of a plan? A plan to trap the murderer. And I can help you trap him? You can be the bait. Now, 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 just hold on a moment. Yeah, let me explain. There is nothing to explain. Now, whatever you have in mind, I refuse to let Yvette risk her life. Nonsense, Pierre. My life is in danger anyway. Precisely. The killer will strike again, but not for the reason you think. What do you mean? In that note he sent Yvette, he swore he would kill her if I did not stop trying to unmask her. But that is not the reason Yvette was attacked. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, she was not deliberately attacked at all. How can you say such a thing? And look at the bruises on her face, her arms, the gash over her eyes. Use your ears, my friend, no more than your eyes. I did not say Yvette was not attacked. I said she was not deliberately attacked. Nor was she attacked... By the person who wrote the note. Monsieur Dupin, you amaze me. How do you know all this? (laughs) Because two plus two equal four if you put them together properly. 
I'll help you by showing you the facts once again. But you must add them up. First, we know that the killer entered the Lisplané apartment by the window and left by the window because it was not locked, though it appeared to be. Yeah, the nail was broken, yes. As you discovered, Pierre. Uh, yes, uh, quite so, quite so. Now, this apartment is next door to the Lisplané apartment. Outside that window, it's a four-story drop to the backyard unless the murderer escaping slid down the drain pipe attached to the wall between these apartments. You follow? Yes. A sailor, Monsieur Dupin. A sailor, maybe, like Jules Dubourg. There you go again, letting your jealousy... No, no, mademoiselle, he's altogether right. A sailor could climb the drain pipe. So much for that fact. Now, here's another and a most revealing one. Why was the bag of gold pieces worth, as we've learned, more than $4,000? Why was that bag of gold not taken? Perhaps the murderer was in such a hurry to escape But there that... was no hurry. The door was bolted. There was plenty of time to escape. You said the gold wasn't taken because it wasn't wanted. But what were the Lespanets killed for, if not the money? Revenge? It couldn't be that. They stayed to themselves. They knew no one. Well, if not for money or revenge, what then? Nothing. Nothing? Monsieur Dupin, that makes no sense. No sense at all. Precisely. That's the answer. The Lispany murders were senseless. But that is impossible. The murderer must have killed for a reason. No, he did not. And why do you keep saying murderer when there were two? You're forgetting one of the most important facts of all. The fact that two voices were heard in the Lispany apartment... One was definitely that of a Frenchman, but the other, uh, you shall see tonight, if Mademoiselle will indeed act as the bait. Of course. What do you want me to do? Do not lock your windows and do not bolt your doors. That is all. <laughs> that is enough. Now be calm, my friend. Your fiancée will not be alone. We shall be with her, both of us armed with pistols. Oh, and uh, one thing more, Mademoiselle. Monsieur? That... A perfume of yours, a passionate night. And be sure to use it. Use a lot of it. If you say so, yes. Why? Uh, the murderer, I think, uh, finds it uh, enticing. <laughs> if it comes to that, so do I. Two o'clock. No sign yet of the murderer. He'll come, of that I'm sure. Especially since Mademoiselle did indeed use a sufficiency of a uh, passionate night perfume. <laughs> it makes waiting a pleasure, Mademoiselle. Uh, thank you, Monsieur Dupin. It won't make you that's death a pleasure. If she will not be harmed, I promise you. I have a pistol and so have you. I'll be sure to use it when I give the word. And, uh, Pierre. Yes? Shoot. To kill. Well, depend on it. I shall certainly... Shh. Listen. Come back. Come back, I tell you. Let me get to the window. Yes, it's coming. It's climbing the drain pipe. It? Damn you, come back. And someone climbing the pipe behind it, trying to reach it, trying to stop it. You keep saying it. What do you mean, it? You'll see in a moment. Get back, well back. You, mademoiselle, you stay there. Pierre? Yes, the instant it appears in the window, I'll give the order to shoot. Remember, shoot to kill. Don't worry about that. Now, shoot! It's still alive. Shoot again. Light the lamps while I get to the window and... Dubourg! Jules Dubourg! Come up! Don't try to escape. Dubourg, I was right. It is Jules Dubourg. Oh, who else, my friend? He's the only sailor living in this arrondissement. <laughs> Come in, Dubu. Come in. Please, it was not my fault. It was not my fault. I'm well aware of that. You've nothing to fear, although you thought you had. On the floor? My God, what is it? It's the Russian, the German, the Italian, the foreign voice. It was no language at all. I'm not as familiar as I might be with the ape family, Dubu. What is it? A gorilla? A baboon? What? An orangutan. 
A what? An orangutan. The large ape found in the jungles of Borneo. And this... This is the monster that killed Madame L'Espanay and her daughter? Yes, yes, yes. And heaven help me, I am responsible. There was nothing I could do, monsieur, nothing. Well, you could have notified the police. You should have. They would have handled matters for you with dispatch, but you didn't do that because you still hoped to sell the ape, didn't you? Can you blame me? I'm a poor man and sick. I need money. I brought the orangutan back from Borneo in the hope of selling it. I paid to have the ship's gardener build a special box with air holes to hold it. Paid money I could ill afford. And God help me, when I engaged those rooms in the cellar, I should have kept it in the box. But I felt sorry for it. It looked so human. It was so human that I let it out and kept it in one of the rooms. How did this beast come to kill Madame L'Espanay and her daughter? It escaped from the room I kept it in. I wasn't there when it happened. I discovered it when I came home that night. I opened the door, and I could not believe it. The ape was seated in front of a mirror, shaving himself with my straight razor. Shaving himself? Well, trying to. They are great imitators, you know. I went to take the razor from him. I was not afraid of him. He was really harmless. But he ran from me, out through the door, and into the backyard. You chased him? Of course. I was afraid he might cut himself with a razor. Well, his eye caught the window of the Espanay apartment because the light was on. Up the drain pipe he went, and I after him. He tore the window open and went in, and the screaming began. You wrote that note to Yvette, didn't you? That note that threatened her life? Yes, but only to frighten you of the case. I was afraid if you found out what had happened, I would be sent to the guillotine. I believe you. But why did you let the ape attack Yvette? I didn't. I couldn't control it. And it was drawn to her by that perfume she wears. My perfume? That time when we were kissing and holding each other close, the ape smelled her perfume on me. What, what? I brought the scent of your perfume back to my cellar rooms. It was on my clothes. The ape couldn't get enough of smelling my jacket. He liked the perfume, enjoyed it. And so... When he escaped last night, and tonight, he followed the scent here. But he didn't mean to harm you any more than he meant to harm the Espanese. It was your screams and theirs that frightened him and made him do the horrible things he did. <clears throat> Jules Dubourg, I hereby place you under arrest as the party responsible for the murders in the Rue Morgue. We will go at once to headquarters. Come along. Oh, and, uh, Yvette. Yes, Sherry? After Dubourg has been booked, I shall return. And we will discuss the kissing and the holding each other close that left such a strong smell of passionate night on his jacket. All right, you, Dubourg. Get along. He's very angry with you, your fiancé. He will cool off. Hmm. Uh, You will have no doubt a satisfactory explanation for him? No. But there are other ways, Monsieur Dupin. There are other ways. (laughs) There are indeed, Mademoiselle. There are indeed. (laughs) (laughs) So ends the murders in the Rue Morgue. If not happily, at least on an easier note. I may tell you that Yvette did cool Pierre's anger and that they wound up eventually with nine children, very handsome and healthy children who became the pride and joy of Sergeant Pierre Musset. I'll be back shortly. I cannot close without an expression of gratitude to Edgar Allan Poe, a sensitive man whose life was an almost incessant and unrelenting torment, such torture for him that he sought release in alcohol and drugs. 
Fillette gave the world immeasurable pleasure with his stories of the macabre, the horrible, the arcane. He may even have given to the world one of the greatest fictional detectives literature has ever known, Sherlock Holmes. I don't know about others, but I must ask, had it not been for C. Auguste Dupin, would there have been a Sherlock Holmes? Our cast included Paul Hecht, Guy Sorrell, Corinne Orr, and Dan Ocko. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Shh, listen. Oh, no. What's that? What's he saying? He's, he's, he's crying. Crying as if his, as if his heart would break. Yes, I can hear him. Poor man. Well, what is he crying over? It can't be the painting. Even if it had been damaged when those sailors bumped the box, Elvira, it it can't be that. It isn't. Isn't? I told you I've had this feeling all along. This sense of something. You know. And now I'm sure. It isn't a painting that's in that box, Will. It's a corpse. And the question that I've been asking myself all along is, who's... Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... The time, 1934. The place, a street in New York City. Kidnap Doc Savage? Are you crazy? You're not paid to ask questions, Leaking. Just do it. But but better guys than us have died trying to nail Doc Savage. And he's put so many crooks behind bars, the news rags call him a one-man army fighting for justice. That do-gooders make me tired. Uh, He's more than just a do-gooder, Howard. They say he spends his whole life getting in the way of guys like us. No wonder anybody plotting something tries to put him out of the picture first. Forget that. I just figure out how to get it. You know what he looks like? I think so. I've seen his mug in the papers a couple of times. His skin and hair look like metal. Yeah, bronze. They say it got that color from him gallivanting all over the world looking for adventure. Well, then he shouldn't be hard to spot. I've heard he's well over six feet tall with muscles. Hercules. I don't know, Howard. He don't seem big so much. More like powerful. Ah, that's just a front. They say he was raised by scientists on a special program trying to turn him into a physical and mental superman. And he learns secrets from Hindu mystics, South Sea pearl divers, African hunters. And he keeps in shape with daily exercises of all of it. Super eyesight, super hearing doing mathematical formulas in his head. You know, a lot of hooey. What if it worked? Never mind that. I'll just figure out how to get it. Okay. But where do I find him? I don't know. And I've heard he works out of a fabulous headquarters in the highest skyscraper in the city. But he hasn't seen in public often. <laughs> no wonder. Maybe if you tail one of his sidekicks, they'll lead you to him. Oh, yeah, yeah. Them five guys who always pal around with him. One's a big shot chemist, one's a hot shot lawyer. Right. And another's a crack engineer. And one's a famous archaeologist. And the last, they say, is an electrical genius. Hey, what if they get in the way when we try to put the snatch on Savage? Do we bring them all? Next. 
All they're getting paid for is keeping Savage out of the way for a while. Who wants him out of the way? Never mind. You want your dough, earn it. Now get out of here. And don't come back until you've got Doc Savage. Here comes Monk Mayfair, the ape like chemist. Lasers! Ham Brooks, the sword wielding lawyer. Take that! Rennie Renwick, the two fisted engineer. Holy cow! Long Tom Roberts, the adventurous electrical genius. Pipe down, you guys. Johnny Littlejohn, the fighting archaeologist. I'll be super amalgamated. And their leader, the greatest adventure hero of the 1930s, the man of bronze, Doc Savage. The Variety Arts Radio Theater, by special arrangement with Condé Nast Publications, presents The Adventures of Doc Savage, a new series of radio adventures based on the novels by Lester Dent. Today, Kidnapped, Chapter One of the fantastic story Fear Key. Ah, good morning, Mr. Savage. Nice day. Yes, it is, officer. Uh, out for your afternoon constitutional? In a way. However, I suppose with all the adventure you see, a nice peaceful walk is something of a luxury. Uh, taking your mind off work, that is. You could say that. Uh, well, I won't be taking up any more of your time. Good day to you, Mr. Savage. Hmm. Oh, officer, is this your wallet on the sidewalk? What's that? I say... What? Yes! Let me through. Let me through. I'm a doctor. Uh, but, Dora, what's going on here? This man has been stricken with heart failure. But I was just talking to him not more than ten seconds ago. Maybe. But we've got to rush him to the emergency hospital to save his life. Give me a hand. Uh, to save his luck, there's a taxi at the curb. Yeah. Convenience. Into the cab with him now. Thanks, officer. I can take care of him from here. Oh, uh, nothing doing. I'm going along with you. Is that necessary? (laughs) This big bronze guy is Doc Savage, no less. And I'm going to see that he gets the best. Driver, head for the emergency hospital. When we get there, I'll make a call to Doc Savage's headquarters and tell his sidekicks what's happened. You won't tell nobody nothing, Flatfoot. (sighs) Okay, Shorty, take off. You know where to go. Right. When that cop piled in the car, I figured we were sunk, leaking. Well, we don't need to worry about him now. Where we dumped him, he'll have a nice long walk home. Uh, Howard is sure paying enough to have us pinch this bronze guy. Any idea what the shyster has up his sleeve? Nah, and I don't care. <sighs> Lucky Howard's office is near the service elevator. I don't think I could drag this big guy much farther. Here we are. Drop him. I'll open the door. Who's that? Me! Leaking! I thought I told you not to come back until you got back savvy. What do you think this is, shyster? Wet wash? Holy. It is Doc Savage. Well, you wanted him, didn't you? Yes, but how did you do it? I dropped a fake wallet on the street with a gadget in it that threw gas in his face when he opened it. Put him down there, shorty. I never thought you'd get him that easy. Yeah, but he sure is as big as they say. I'm sweating like a stuck pig. You're always sweating. That's why they call you leaking. Leaking? Never mind that. So, Howitt, here he is. What do we do now? I'll tie him up and keep him like we were told. I'll get some rope. Okay, Shorty, you can go. Thanks, leaking. I don't want to be around when the big guy comes to. Uh, he ain't so much. Just the same. See you later. Here's some strong rope. Let's get him trussed up before he comes around. You're a little too late, gentlemen. What the... Oh, he's got me by the throat. Oh, oh, me too. Put us down. Just as soon as I find out what weapons you may have. I hate you're shaking us apart. That's what I wanted to find. An automatic and a thirty-eight. Okay, so you got our guns. Now what? Now, gentlemen, you're going to take a little nap on the sofa. Ah. I hope you have hard heads. 
And you conveniently supplied me with a rope. There. That should hold you for a while. Monk, you and Ham get over to the Chandler building, 20th floor. Office of a lawyer named Hallett. Hallett and another man named Leaking have tried to abduct me off the street. You'll find them trussed up on the office sofa. You know what to do with them. Now, let's find out what this is all about. Come, come, gentlemen. I knock your skulls together just hard enough to keep you out for only a moment. Oh, hit me. No, the Doc Savage... It wasn't a dream. Not at all. Now, I want some answers. You went to a great deal of trouble to seize me off the street. Why? I thought that wall of gag was foolproof. I figured that gas would keep you out for days. The gas never had any effect on me in the first place. What? You underestimate my powers of observation. When you dropped that trick wallet, I saw you. You mean you picked it up knowing it was a trick? I picked it up most carefully, if you had noticed. There were two logical things to suspect, a poisoned needle or gas. To avoid a needle, I didn't open the wallet in the usual manner, and to checkmate the gas, I merely held my breath until the vapor had dissipated. But why? Why pretend to be overcome? Merely to find out what your game was. Now I repeat, why did you seize me? Hal had told me to. I don't know why he wanted you, but he gave me a C note to do it. Well, then we'll question Mr. Hallett. Oh, what happened? He's wise to us, Hallett. Not completely. I want to know why you paid Mr. Leaking here to abduct me. Won't talk, eh? Well, if you won't talk, out the window you go. Now, wait. Oh, oh. oh no. Oh. No. Wait, wait, wait. I'll talk. I'll tell you everything. That's better. All right, Hallett, let's hear it. We were hired. We were, were to get $10,000 for grabbing you and holding you where no one could find you for two weeks. So someone wants me out of circulation for two weeks. Who? I don't know. Window is still open. Fountain of Youth. Fountain of Youth Incorporated hired me. And just who is Fountain of Youth Incorporated? Well, it was handled in a roundabout way. I got a phone call with the proposition to seize and hold you. The party who called said there was no need of us ever seeing each other. In fact, it would be better if we didn't. The only name I got was Fountain of Youth. Why did this Fountain of Youth Incorporated want me held? I asked that, but they said there was no need for me to know. Does Fountain of Youth have an office? Yes, room 1402 Queen Tower Building. I had their phone traced, too. It's the same address. Oh, you were curious about this mysterious Fountain of Youth also. Uh, do you blame me for trying to get a line on them? Well, thanks for the information, Mr. Hallett. Uh, two of my assistants, Monk Mayfair and Ham Brooks, will be up here shortly... He'll deal with you. Oh, by the way, Mr. Hallett, Ham Brooks is a lawyer himself, and I'm sure he'll take measures to see that you're disbarred. That should be Monk and Ham now. Think again, Savage. Get them hands up. Hey, Shorty. I come back because Leaking forgot to pay me. Then I hear this Savage guy pumping you, so I had me rod ready. Good work, Shorty. Cut us loose. No, wait. Just give us your knife. Keep that gun on, Savage. Right. Here. Quick, Leaking. Cut the rope. Yeah, yeah. Watch Savage, Shorty. Don't worry, he's covered. Back against the wall, bronze man. I don't think I plan to stick around, Shorty. Uh, get back, Savage. I got this gap pointed right at your chest. Wait! Doc Savage always wears a bulletproof vest. Aim at his head! His head! Too late! <laughs> <laughs> He's heading for the window. He's jumping. Where'd he go? Was there a rope or something in here he could have used to slide down to the ground? Twenty stories. Besides, the only rope was the one he used to tie us. He'd have take a fly to stick to that wall. I always did hear this Doc Savage ain't quite human. Oh, shut up. Search the office. That bronze guy's got to be here somewhere. Yes? This is the Fountain of Youth Incorporated. Has our little project been concluded? Well, uh, sort of. I don't understand. Oh, we got Doc Savage. But he escaped. Connice! How could you be so stupid? But you're not... Never mind. 
Come into the office of a fountain of youth. I know you are aware of its address. If I'm not here to give you mindless dolts orders, there will be an envelope under the blotter on my desk with the directions inside. See that you do not bungle them as badly as you've already done. Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Uh, Mr. Since uh, you are so curious about our organization, I will tell you my name. It is uh, Santini. Just Santini? That is enough. Come to Fountain of Youth, now! Who is that, Havit? A guy named Santini from Fountain of Youth. He said where to get over there right away. Why didn't you tell him what he could do with his kidnapping idea? Trying to nab Savage is worth more than we're getting. Oh, I forgot to tell you, Leaking, there's a $10,000 bonus waiting for us at the Fountain of Youth. Well, uh, that's different. Let's set sail. What about Savage? Where'd he go? Oh, forget about that for now. It won't be hard to find him again. Come on. Look. Look, there's two guys coming up the stairs. Holy cow, what a pair. One of them looks like a gorilla. And check out the clothes on the other. What a dude. They're the two that Savage said would be coming. I've seen their pictures in the papers. The ape-like one is Monk Mayfair. The fashion plate is Ham Brooks, the lawyer. They're coming to this office. Get back inside. Get your rods ready. Here's the office, Shyster. Doc said they'd be tied up inside. Well, what are you waiting for, you dumb missing link? Open the door. Look out! I guess they ain't tied up after all. Any sign of Doc? No. That's your super machine pistol? Of course. I always carry it. Loaded with Doc's anesthetic mercy bullets? As always. Oh, good. Let's give it to him. Yeah! Think we got any of them? No, you hairy freak. And why'd you shove your face through the door so fast? Oh, who told me to? Besides, I wanted to see if Doc was in there. And if you keep calling me names, I'll shove you out there with them red hops and get a shot at you. Where could Doc have gone? I suppose you'd open out with that great legal brain of yours while I try to wing one of them birds. Wait! What's that rolling down the hall? Tear gas! Run! Where? Down the stairs! If you had kept your noisy trap shut, I would have heard them throw that crybaby canister. One of these days, I'm going to see if there's a man into that hairy hide. Listen, upstairs. They're getting into the freight elevator. Come on. Here, here's the door on the floor. Give me your cane. Why? I'm going to use the sword inside it to loosen the lock on the elevator door. If we can pry it open, the car will stop between floors. Let you ruin my sword? Let me do it. Okay, Shyster, but get to it. I'll shove on the door. There they go. Hurry up. That did it. Car stopped a couple of floors down. They could still shoot up to the grilled roof of that cage. Keep back. Well, what do we do now? Let them go. Doc! Doc! Where'd you go, Doc? I slid from the office window down to the window below, Monk, using the collapsible grappling hook I always carry. Now let the doors close. <laughs> But, Doc, how come? If we tried to jump down on the cage, they'd have the advantage, Ham. Besides, I want to find out what this is all about. And since I think they'll head for the Queen Tower building, we'll trail them there. What's at the Queen Tower building? The office of the Fountain of Youth, Incorporated. What the deuce is the Fountain of Youth, Incorporated? The company that hired them to abduct me. Come on, I have a cab waiting downstairs. <laughs> Here we are, Queen Tower building. Hey, Doc, look at that funny little duck over there. <laughs> Dressed as spiffy as the shyster here. Derby, spats, red sash. Did that mustache. Must be three inches long on each side. He had skinny as a pencil. Pretty elegant. No more elegant than the pearl-handled automatic he's pulling out of his coat. Look out. After him. He's heading into the building. He's running out the back to the alley. There he goes. Get him. No use. He's got a car waiting. Oh. 
enough for some machine. Looked like it had bulletproof windows and solid rubber tires. Back inside. Let's find out who he was. Oh. Doorman, who was that? Uh, uh, th- that? That was Mr. Santini, sir. And who is Mr. Santini? He, he's the president of Fountain of Youth. Mr. Santini seems to know us by sight. That doesn't mean anything, you accident of nature. Doc's picture often appears in newspapers and magazines. Nobody but you would think of that, shyster. The thing that puzzles me most is why these men should be so anxious to get us out of the way. Perhaps the office of Fountain of Youth Incorporated will yield an answer. Perhaps. Let's try it. Here's the office, Doc. Should we barge right in? Wait a moment. Using your super hearing on the door, huh, Doc? Seems to be no one inside. Locked. It's never stopped us before. Got your lock picked, Doc? In my pocket. Come on. Oh, <laughs> some digs. Leather furniture, rich carpeting, even the latest automatic typewriters and dictaphones. That door over there says it's Santini's office. Wow, even plusher. This Santini does all right for himself. Look at the size of that desk. More interesting is the crumpled envelope on the desk. Hmm. What's so interesting about that envelope, Doc? It's moist, Ham, as if crumpled by a perspiring palm. So? One of the fellows who grabbed me was called Leaking, probably because of some affliction which makes him perspire a great deal. Only a man who sweats freely would have damp palms on a day like this. So those guys have been here. Let's take a look in the desk. Hey, Doc. Looks like someone wrote something on the top sheet of this pad of paper and then tore it off. Wait a moment. Got something on your equipment desk that'll bring out the impression of the writing? I think so, Monk. We'll try this liquid. Looks like blood. Iodine vapor. It brings out impressions left by pencil points. It's coming. Let's see. Kel Avery, due in on 8 o'clock plane from Florida, must be prevented from communicating with Doc Savage. Grab Avery and hold for me. Santini. Boy, now we're getting places. But leaking in Hallett beat us here, Doc. They have the message, too. What are we going to do? It's five o'clock. That gives us three hours before the Florida plane bearing this Kel Avery arrives. Let's look around a little more. We know that thrilling sound, Doc. It means you found something really interesting. What is it, Doc? Some very intriguing files, Ham. Look at the names on them. Fascinating. For the love of mud! They look like a who's who of all the town's money bags. Yes, an index of the richest men in New York City. And there are other files of wealthy individuals listed by states. Hmm. Every rich man in America. Wonder what it means. Interesting. The files give not only the man's name and the probable size of his fortune, but also his age and the state of his health. I think I get it, Doc. Yes. Get what? I'll explain, stupid. The man... The phone. Do we answer it? I've only heard Hallett's voice for a few moments, but I think I can imitate it. The Office of Fountain of Youth Incorporated. Perfect, Doc. Kale Avery can be found at 1120 Fish Lane. But I thought Kale Avery was... Was on a plane bound for New York? You are mistaken. Kale Avery is at 1120 Fish Lane. Who is this? Connection isn't very good. And I... You never heard my voice before, Mr. Hallett. Then who are you? You know my voice. You take care of Kale Avery. I'll explain who I am later. Who was that, Doc? It was the strangest voice, Monk. Indescribably young and joyful. What did he say? He seemed to know all about this business, Ham. He knew enough to call Fountain of Youth. He knew who Hallett was. He knew about the Florida flight. And... He said that Kel Avery is not on that plane. Who is the mysterious stranger who seems to know so much about the abduction of Doc Savage? What is the Fountain of Youth Incorporated? And why do they want Doc and his aides out of the way? Don't miss The Hanging Man, Chapter 2 of Fear Key, next time on... The Adventures of Doc Savage.
Fear Key was written by Lester Dent and adapted for radio by Roger Rittner. Featured in the cast were Daniel Chodos, Robert Towers, Art Dutch, Douglas Kohler, William Irwin, and Bob Farley. Also heard were Michael McConaughey, Scott McKenna, Glenn Shaddix, and Bob Lyon. Sound effects were created by David Surtees, assisted by Jerry Williams. Production assistance by Samantha Kimmel and Doris Christie. Engineering by Denny King. Adventures of Doc Savage is produced and directed by Roger Rittner and is a presentation of the Variety Arts Radio Theater. Dr. Weir. Good evening. Come in, won't you? Well, what's the matter? You seem a bit nervous. Perhaps the cemetery outside this house has upset you. But there are things far worse than cemeteries. For instance... The feeling of being cut off from the world by an insanely jealous man is in the story I want to tell you tonight. The story I call Beauty and the Beast. My story begins in New England on a lonely, desolate cliff overlooking the Atlantic Ocean. Near the edge of the cliff, which towers 200 feet above the rocks below, a young man stands, a mere shadow in the darkness of the night. Time and time again, he impatiently turns to look at the huge, foreboding old manor house, which is perched near the cliff's edge. Suddenly, out of the darkness, a beautiful girl appears and runs to his outstretched arms. Oh, oh Kathy, darling, why are you so late? I couldn't slip out of the house any sooner, Alan. Jason was watching my every move. Oh, Kathy, he's twice your age. I know. He's the ugliest man I've ever known. Whatever made you marry him? I don't know. After my father died, I was all alone. Jason kept after me to marry him. Something in his eyes forced me to say yes. I was afraid to refuse. Well, you're not going on living with him. I'm going to take you away. Oh, Alan, you don't know what you're saying. I can't leave. Why not? If I were to run away, Jason would follow you and kill you. He'd kill you the way he killed... The way he killed... Whom? Uh, you remember George Davis, don't you? Why, of course. He was Jason's secretary. Well, one evening, two weeks ago, Jason found me talking to George in the library. A thing he'd forbidden me to do. And the next morning, Jason told me he discharged George, and that he'd already left. But then I discovered that all of George's clothes were still in his room. His clothes were in his room? Yes. Surely if he'd been discharged, he'd have taken them with him. Then you think that I'm you... sure of it. He must have killed George that very night. You kill anyone he thinks is trying to take me away from him. Oh, darling, I couldn't stand to have anything happen to you. <laughs> oh, darling, nothing's going to happen to me. Not to you. I'm taking you away from here. What time can you meet me here tomorrow night? I think I can manage to slip away around nine o'clock. All right, darling, nine o'clock it is. Now you better return to the house before Jason misses you. <laughs> Jason! We 
Where, where are you, Catherine? Oh, I'm just out getting some fresh air. You're lying. You slipped out to meet someone. No, Jason, really. I... Oh, Jason, my arm. You're hurting me. Who was it? Alan? What is Alan? Tell me or I'll... Beg pardon, sir, but Sheriff Rogers is here to see you. Very well, child. Show him in. I'll do all the talking, Catherine. Good evening, Mr. Winthrop. Miss Winthrop. Sorry to intrude, but I must. What can I do for you, Sheriff? I understand you have a secretary, George Davis. I did have. I discharged him two weeks ago. Why are you so interested, Sheriff? Because his body was washed ashore this afternoon, Ooh. 20 miles down the coast. Well? There were deep gashes on the body as though it had fallen from a great height onto the rocks and the sea. It may be suicide, and it may be murder. You say it may be murder? Yeah. Surely you don't suspect I had anything to do with it, do you? I don't know. There have been some mighty strange things happening around here. Four months ago, Sam Arnold, your chauffeur, was murdered, and now... Sam Arnold? Murdered? You seem surprised, Miss Winthrop. Don't you know he was murdered? I'm afraid she doesn't, Sheriff. She's been ill for quite some time, so I kept the news from her. Oh, then she doesn't know that Arnold was stabbed to death less than a hundred yards from this house. Oh, no, no. I thought he'd been discharged. Who... Who did it? Well, we haven't found Sam's murder yet, Miss Winthrop. Now we have another mystery on our hands, the death of George Davis. Miss Winthrop, I want you and your wife to be at the coroner's inquest in the village day after tomorrow. Quite a few questions we want to ask you about the deaths of both Sam Arnold and George Davis. There's a lot more going on around here than meets the eye. Dr. Weird's story will continue in a little while. And now I... Young man, before you go on, remember where you are. You know what happens on this program to people who aren't careful what they say. Oh, uh, I'll be careful. I'm always careful. Careful with my facts whenever I talk about Adam Hatz. You see... Adam hats are so downright good-looking, I have to be careful about my enthusiasm. And the makers of Adam hats are careful, too. Careful to see that every Adam is well-made. Look at any Adam, and you can see for yourself the quality workmanship that goes into the designing of Adam smart styling, perfect fit, and correct details. Care, too, is taken in the choice of material and color. That's why only genuine all-fur felt in the newest shades is used in Adam hats. So if you're a careful dresser and a careful spender, choose an Adam. Still priced at three forty-five to ten dollars. Still America's outstanding hat value. Now, back to Doctor Weird. And now I'll finish my story, Beauty and the Beast. Twenty-four hours have passed, each one of which has been an eternity to Kathy. Try as she would. She couldn't forget the deaths of Sam Arnold and George Davis. One thing seemed perfectly clear to her. Jason had murdered the two men in a jealous rage. He would stop at nothing in his madness. Her mind in a turmoil, Kathy waited tensely for nine o'clock and her meeting with Alan. Catherine, why do you keep looking at the clock every other minute? I am uh, not aware that I am. Is it because you have some secret rendezvous with someone? No, 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 I haven't. You're lying. Whom are you going to meet? Tell me. Oh, Jason, my arm. Oh, tell me. No one, no one. You're lying. I ought to kill you. Yes, kill me. Get rid of me. So I can't testify tomorrow at the coroner's inquest. What are you talking about? You want to kill me because you're afraid of what I might tell them. You, I know you killed Sam Arnold and George Davis. Is that what you intend to tell them tomorrow? Yes, you're nothing but a murderer. Jason. Jason. Don't look at me that way, Jason. I'm not going to let you kill me. Stay away from me, Jason. I won't let you kill me. Put down that poker, Catherine. Put it down, I say. No, if you come any closer, Jason, I'll use it. Jason, go or I'll use it. I warned you, Jason. I warned you. Catherine, Catherine, you mustn't cry. You struck Jason in self-defense. Oh, what are we going to do? We're going through with the plans I've made. I have two tickets and a plane for Mexico. And we're going tonight. Catherine! Jason! Oh, there you are. You're, you're not dead. I didn't kill you. No. The blow you struck me only... Alan, what are you doing here? I've come to take Kathy away, Jason. Alan, you don't know what you're saying. I'm warning you, Jason. Don't try to stop me. You don't understand, Alan. She's a murderess. She killed two men. What are you saying? I never killed anyone. Alan, I'm telling you the truth. 
She killed Sam Arland and George A. Davis. You're lying. You're lying. I didn't. How could she possibly kill two men and not know it? Because she's insane. Insane? A homicidal maniac. There are times when she loses control of her mind. And when she does, she kills. And then she comes to and has no memory of it, I suppose. Yes, yes, that's it exactly. Uh, Just a minute before she pushed George Davis off this very cliff we're standing on, I heard her talking to him. Her voice was low, excited, the voice of a homicidal maniac. Before I could reach them, she'd pushed him off this cliff. And then she fainted. And when she regained consciousness, she had no memory of what had happened. No, no, it isn't true, Alan. He's trying to blame me for murders he's committed. Yes, I know, I know, dear. Your story's very clever, Jason. It account rather nicely for the death of those two men, wouldn't it? I'm telling you the truth, do you hear? And I'm going to tell it to the coroner's jury tomorrow. I protected her as long as I can. You're not going to tell the coroner's jury anything tomorrow. Alan, she's insane. No. She has to be exposed for both our sake. Why, Alan, let go of me. Oh, you don't go, deserve I, to live trying to make Kathy pay for your crimes. No, no, no Alan. No. Don't be up. You must listen to me. Oh. Alan, don't. Oh. There was no other way out, Kathy. He was insane. Utterly insane, trying to make it appear that you murdered Sam Arnold and George Davis when he did it himself. What? He... Alan, what is it? What's wrong? I just remembered something. When Sam Arnold was murdered four months ago, Jason and I were on a hunting trip in Canada. Why, we heard the news together over Jason's portable radio. You mean Jason didn't kill Sam Arnold? I know he couldn't have. But, but if Jason didn't murder him, who... Kathy. Alan, why are you looking at me like that? You don't think that I did it, do you? Kathy, if Jason didn't do it, then what he said about you might have been true. You believe that it is true, don't you? I can see it in your eyes. You do believe I murdered Sam Arnold and George Davis, don't you? Kathy, the voice, it's different. You do believe I murdered them, don't you? Your voice is just the way Jason said it was before you pushed George Davis off the cliff. It's true. You did kill him, didn't you? Yes. Yes, I did. At times like this, I can remember. I killed Sam Arnold with a knife. And I pushed George Davis over the cliff. Would you like to know how I did it, Alan? Kathy, your voice, your eyes. Kathy, what are you up to? I pushed him off the cliff like this, Alan, like this, Kathy, Alan. Kathy, look out! Alan, I'm slipping out! Oh! Huh? Oh, she's gone. She was trying to kill me. And she fell over herself. She was the murderer. And nobody dreamed of suspecting her. Because she was so beautiful. Alan was right. Nobody dreamed of suspecting Kathy because she was so beautiful. But her husband, who was ugly, well, he was suspected right away. You see how handy a pretty face can be? Uh, Sometimes. But there's an old saying... Beauty is only skin deep. So be careful about walking on clifftops with lovely young women. One of them might be another Kathy. Oh, you have to go now. Well, perhaps you'll drop in on me again soon. Just look for the house on the other side of the cemetery. The house of Dr. Weird. herald of life and death, success or failure, the unseen force that measures man's destiny, reaching its most fateful moment as it slowly strikes the eleventh hour.
got to go out for supplies today, Steve. I know. I'll go later. Not alone, you won't. Uh, we'll see when the time comes. Billy, go on up to your room. But, Mom... And don't go looking out of the windows. You keep the curtains drawn, you hear me? Hodge, Mom, I had to stay indoors all day yesterday, too. It won't be for much longer, son, I promise. They got no right to say things about you, Pop. And you've got no right to let them. How much longer will it be? They'll get tired of it. Oh, will they try something else? I say let's go on in and drag the whole bunch of them out here. <laughs> Bernie doesn't sound like he's halfway started yet. Stop worrying, honey. Worrying? You said they get tired of picketing the house. It's been nearly four days now, Steve. We've got to do something. I tried the police. Nothing. Is it because Bernie is the sheriff's nephew? Could be. You better make up your mind to it, Blaine. Ain't no one getting in or out of that house, so you've been out to talk with it. You hear me in my ear? Oh, why don't you talk with him, Steve? Because well, if I... I... you not to open that window, didn't I, Billy? No, I'm sorry, Mom. If you ever do anything you told, haven't I got enough on my mind without you making things worse? I ought to give Take you... Take it, honey. Easy. Take it easy. Easy. If it wasn't for your stupid high-mindedness, we wouldn't be in this mess. Oh. oh, Steve, I'm sorry. I'll go make us some coffee. You better stay down here with us, Billy. What is it they've got against you, Pa? Uh, nothing really, son. You see, if we lived in Fresno or Los Angeles, almost any other town in California, this wouldn't have happened. But Warren, oh, we like it, sure, but it really isn't much more than a whistle to stop, is it? But, Pop, what does that have to do with Mr. Burnley and those other men? Why, that's it, seems to me, boy. A little place like Warren, folks get to feel things more, maybe. Nothing much else for them to do except to get all steamed up about nothing. It's not true, is it, Pop? What the kids were saying at school before you stopped me going? What were they saying? That the government didn't trust you to work at Moorfield Research Station anymore. Anything else, son? Well, Lee Franklin said you were a traitor and you ought to be in jail. Are you coming out or are we coming in, Barney? Ain't no room in They're all saying it, Pop. You've got to make them... It's okay, honey. It's just a stone with a message wrapped around it. What does it say, Pop? Doesn't the fact that they broke a window mean anything? Oh, Sheriff Donovan can't sit on the fence any longer. He's got to protect us. In the old days, we used to lynch horse thieves. Now we're thinking of starting in on scientists. Signed Ed Burnley. Oh, go out there and tell them the truth, Steve, please. What is the truth? I don't even know myself anymore. If I tell them why I left the research station, it, it's not going to be very convincing without official backing. And as security told me, right now they can't afford to back me up. It's going awful quiet out there, Pop. Come back here. They've gone. I don't believe it. Will you two come away from that window? Couldn't we get the car out and go down to the store, Steve? It's probably just what they're waiting for. Hey, Pop, there's someone coming. Looks like Sheriff Donovan. Uh, go, let him in, will you, son? No, he comes. After four days. He's carrying a rifle, Paul. What do you think he wants, Steve? Judging by the way he acted when I rang to ask him to get rid of Burnley and the others, I'd say he wants us out of Warren. But it's our home. I'm sorry, honey. I'm frightened. Let's see what Donovan has to say. Ah, good to see you, Sheriff. I wish I could say the same thing about you. Go on up to your room, Billy. But, Mom... This minute... Oh, gee whiz. I uh, think you'd all better get out of Warren fast, Finding. For a spell, anyway. Is that a warning? I don't want no trouble here. Is that why you didn't do anything about the picket line? Now, listen, Finding. Having a real atomic scientist in Warren made folks feel kind of proud. They're entitled to be upset when you won't explain why you ain't working for the government no more. My wife is upset, too, Sheriff. You see that window? Seems to me you're darn lucky. That's all the trouble there's been. Who told the town spoke about Steve Sheriff? Oh, things like this don't take long to get around. 
After all, when they see him in town all the time, knowing that until a couple of weeks ago he was only home weekends, they get to thinking. Thinking what? Ah, uh, just that it's funny. If your old man ain't got nothing to hide, why don't he tell us why he ain't working no more? Or is it because this is a chance you've always wanted to get even with Steve? Forget it. I won't forget it. Sure. You like to boast about Steve Barnning living here, lounging on the store sidewalk and pointing out this house to everyone coming through town. Professor Steve Barnning, man of the year for 1959. Big deal. Born and bred right here in Warren. Came back to live here, too. But that didn't stop you all envying him, did it? Didn't stop you hoping that one day you'd be able to cut him down to size. And you got your chance. The minute you found out he wasn't working at the research station any longer. Yes. Been a lot in the papers lately about the government tightening up on security, Mrs. Vining. It's not going to look good for Warren if we got a security risk right on our back doorstep. Oh, Steve, you've got to tell them. Oh, can't you see? They've got nothing better to do than lounge around thinking the worst. My nephew's talking to a whole lot of them down by the store right now. That's why I came by, Vining. Ed's a hard boy to stop once he gets the bit between his teeth. Would you try to stop him? Depends. On what? I wouldn't want to risk my skin defending a traitor. I... I give you my word. Now listen, will you? Your word ain't good enough. There never was anything to do in this one horse town except talk about what a big guy you'd become. You take that away from him and you're in trouble. You figure I'd have been allowed to come back here if I'd been any kind of a security risk, Sheriff? Oh, that's way over my head. Who started this whole thing, Sheriff? Who started saying I was in trouble? In a town this size, it only takes a couple of words. Someone may be saying, when's Vinan going back to work? That kind of thing. And it snowballs. Soon it's changed to, Vining ain't going back to work. Before long, it's, Vining's got the axe. And then maybe someone adds, Why? After that, there's got to be a reason. And there's only one reason the scientist ever gets kicked out. How many times do I have to tell you I wasn't kicked out? Then prove it. I... I can't. Not yet. And you take my tip, Vining. You get that proof. And fast. <laughs> Vining think he is, anyway. He ain't no better than the rest of us, and he never was. I could have told you that a long time ago. And he come back and married Petty, eh, Barry? Eh? All right, all right. I figured I'm marrying her myself. But that don't make no difference to what I'm saying now. Why don't they want Vining back in Moorfield anymore, huh? I'll tell you why. Because he's a traitor, that's why. And I say, oh, well, I want to... All right, then. Bring it up, bring it up. I said bring it up. You wouldn't want to speak up for a traitor, would you, Tim? I'll talk to you in a minute, Ed Burnley. Go on, the rest of you. Get on about your business. Go on. Go away there. Ain't no law against a man speaking his mind, is there, Tim? None that I know of. Well, then what Just the... shut up and listen, will you? I've seen you at work in the past, Ed. You've got more ability to grab the wrong end of a red-hot poker than anyone I ever saw. Well, that's as plain as the You won't stir up trouble anymore, and I'm going to have to let you cool off in the jailhouse. Nephew or no nephew. I thought he'd get to you. What'd he do? Beg for protection? Start sprouting the Fifth Amendment? He didn't say much at all. It was what his wife said. Peggy Slattery? Peggy Vining. They're married, remember? You ain't never been much of a one for finding, have you, Ed? Oh, look, Tim, have I... you? I hated his insides when we used to go to the old schoolhouse together. Yeah, I was just thinking that time you met his boy out in the woods. Vining beat you up for that, didn't he? I was only joking. I didn't mean to scare the boy none. It, it was just in fun. Pointing a loaded rifle at him? Telling me you were going to shoot him because he was Steve Vining's boy? Yeah, some joke. What brought that up? It's mighty easy to think bad of a person. I've been doing it myself just because I forgot about things like that. Because I forgot and listened to you, Ed. Now, that 
picket line is out from now on. Right? Don't push me, Tim. Push? Push? Just one more word out of you and I'll beat your ears off. Now, look, boy. You're family to me. The only family I got. But that don't give you no extra rights when it comes to making trouble. But you said you're sorry. I know what I said. But because folks in Washington talk a lot of hot air about traitors, I ain't looking for them under every tumbleweed. I've been foolish to go along with you this far, Ed. Trouble is, we're all so scared of the 20th century, we we figure scientists as being different to other folks. But they ain't. And until I know otherwise, for sure, I'm pitching in for a fining. Okay, Sheriff, you do that. But me, I got other plans for that guy. And four days we've been asking him to come out and tell us. That's all. No threats, no nothing. Just asking nice. Well, if he don't talk, I know someone who will. And when I get through, this whole town will know the kind of coyote vining is. Billy can go back to school tomorrow, Peggy. The whole thing's quietened down. It's a quietness I don't like. I don't mind missing school for a while yet, Pa. I'll bet you don't. Anyone speak to you in town yesterday, Steve? No, but give them time. After all, they must feel pretty silly. Most of them were yelling outside the house a few days ago. Oh, I wish I knew where Ed Burnley went. <laughs> Your ex-boyfriend's whereabouts doesn't worry me. He was not my ex-boyfriend. Maybe not, but he sure tried hard enough. Steve, let's leave, Warren. Let's go someplace else to live. It's not the same here anymore. Not right now, no. But it will be. Hey, why don't we go to New York, Pop? I sure would like to live there. But your mother wouldn't. She's a small town girl. I guess I'm the same. I like to be where I know my neighbors. And they refuse to know us. That'll pass. Well, how can you sit there and talk like that? Oh, sure, they, they don't march up and down outside anymore. Every time I walk down the street, I feel like pulling the knives out of my back. When are you going back to work, Pop? Soon? Well, I... I've got to be able to say something to the fellas in school, ain't I? I haven't. Haven't I mean? I'm not going back, son. Not ever. But, but why? Billy, it won't make much sense to you, but for me, my reasons are good. They're, they're sound. They're... Well, there are reasons, that's all. What are you going to do then, Pop? I don't know yet. You see, Billy, your father feels that... Oh, you tell him, Steve. Well, son, put it like this. We're in a rat race. Every country in the world racing to build up a stockpile of weapons that could blow us all to kingdom come. I've done my share to bring that state of affairs about. I don't want to go on along with it anymore. It's as simple as that. You mean you're, you're just quitting? R running out? Hey, now, wait a minute. You know, sometimes when I get home weekends, I find myself looking around this table and realizing I've been spending the whole week working out the most effective way of killing you both. Working out the most horrible way of doing that. Your mother understands this, boy. I'd like you to. Then why don't you tell everyone? Because at the moment, it's a story the newspapers would build big. Scientists sick of arms race. That kind of nonsense. There was no objection to my quitting, but there would be to making my reasons public. There are places in the world where big capital would be made of stuff like that. But I can't tell anyone? That's right. I don't think living here in Warren is going to be much fun from now on, Pop. Billy, what's wrong? Nothing, Pop. Nothing. I'll go up to my room for a while more. Billy! He's never gone without being altered before. Do you think I'm wrong, Peggy? Oh, darling, I don't know what to think. After everything that's happened here, it's so... I 
can't think of it objectively. Are you shying away from telling me you think I'm wrong? You sat there and refused to budge out of the house, even to talk to the picket line. They only wanted to know why in the first place. With Ed Burnley whipping them up with patriotic fervor? You weren't just stubborn because it was him, were you? Were you? Does what he say worry you? A scientist can be as humanly frail as the next person. Oh, but see. You start to split atoms, fiddle with hydrogen bombs, and everyone thinks you're a kind of Superman, a robot. Something that no longer falls prey to any kind of ordinary feeling. And I mean ordinary. Little feelings. The same kind of feelings that govern the town loafer, sitting with his feet up on the hitching rail and brushing the flies away from his face with the back of his hand. And all so petrified about the work I'm doing, or was that they can only think of lynching. I'm so petrified, I can only think of quitting. I love you very much, Steve. And you think I'm wrong? If you must know, I don't have much admiration for anyone who walks out on something, even you. Sorry. You pulled yourself up from nothing. You climbed out of, out of the gutter, for want of a better way of putting it, and... And suddenly, with a ball at your feet, you say, finish, over, no more. Why? Because inside, in the part of me I can't give a scientific name, I guess I'm still the boy who walked the streets of Warren in bare feet. But until now, you've been so busy being the boy who passed all his exams. Who was way out in front of the rest of us. What changed you? Watching Billy grow up. Knowing that together we'd created something that was wonderful. Knowing that in Billy we had something more lasting than anything I could ever achieve alone. But he's ten. Just how long has this gone on? Every day since he was born. And for the first time since he was born, he's not very proud of you. I have a right to quit. Then why didn't you stand up to them when they were outside? I can tell you why. You're ashamed of quitting. Am I? I think so, yes. But Peggy, darling, I... Oh. Yes, Billy, what is it? Okay, if I go out, Mom? Where? Just out, Mom. Well, Billy... I wouldn't mind if you came, Dad. I sure... I'll meet you out front in two seconds flat. <coughs> what was all that about? I don't know. Maybe I'd better go find out. <laughs> Wait till you see the morning paper, Sheriff. Steve Vining's gonna get his from way back. Where have you been these last few days, Ed? Just around. Around where? Washington, maybe? <laughs> they wouldn't even let you take a walk in that city. Okay, Fresno. And Guy Bernie, who runs the Fresno Monitor, was awful interested to hear all about our famous scientist. Just wait, that's all. It is just... Peggy, isn't it? Peggy Slattery? <laughs> what would I want with a girl who'd marry a two-timing atom splitter? Ed, you make him sound like a timber cutter. He's going to be dead wood, that's for sure. I found out a lot of things about that guy. Such as? He'll have to keep, Sheriff. Keep until tomorrow's papers. You know, Uncle Tim, I just might buy me an extra copy. <laughs> Pop, I mean, it's not right. Not right. Grass sure looks green. Let's sit, huh? Sure. Oh, don't just say, no, I won't. You've got to. You sure are a hard guy to follow. You too. Me? Yeah. Why, son? Mom's always saying how clever you are, but what you're doing don't seem so clever to me at all. No? No. Why? Pop, you afraid or something? No. Not scared even a little bit? Of what I'm doing? Or why? Yeah, maybe. It's what I'm going to do. If I ever get through all those papers, exams. I'm not much good on those. You're kind of young to make up your mind so fast. Not me, Pop. I've known a long time. Billy... But I won't back down, that's for sure. Why not? Seems like being a real scary cat to me. It does, huh? 
He does, Pop. Why? Because... Because it's running away and you can't ever run away. Not from bombs or anything. I was only reading the other day, the more we know, the less chance there is of anyone knowing more. And Mom says you know an awful lot, Pop. Don't just not know. Come on. We'd better be getting home. Top flight scientist quits. Why? What is the secret reason? Why has the American public not been told? Professor Stephen Vining, Big Wheel, and the American Nuclear Program quits. Why? <laughs> yeah, why, Steve? <laughs> I can see him now. Yeah, and I can see you, Peggy. Peggy. Peggy Slattery. I'm going to call on you, Peggy. Yeah, and I'm going to take you away from that traitor. <laughs> If I step inside, Peggy Slattery? Yes. Ah, nice to know you remember my name. Hey, you look even prettier than the last time, Peggy. The last time? When I saw you peeking out that window at me when I was standing out front with the others. Remember? <laughs> I saw you, honey. Yeah, and you were looking at me, weren't you? Looking at Ed Burnley. I think you'd better go. Go? Oh, I brought you something. Here, look. Huh? You want to seen this? The Fresno paper. Well, go on, read it. Read what they have to say about Steve Viney. Top flight scientist. Qu Ed Burley, did you do this? Sure I did. I ain't so... Why, Idiot. you little... Ain't no one gonna slap Ed Burnley around, not even you, Peggy. Come here. Don't take your hands off me. Remember way back, uh. the dances I asked you to that you said you couldn't make, Peggy? Well, this is one dance neither of us is gonna miss. Oh, Ed, don't want me... Me. Why don't you call your old man? He's the one should be helping you, honey. He's not home. Well, not home. Well, now, ain't that nice? Ain't that just fine and damn? Keep away from me. You ran away, huh? Uh, That's right, baby. You come right here to me. Oh, let me go, please. You're asking nicely. Real nice. Yeah, it's been a long time, Peggy Slattery. I always figured if I waited long enough, you'd get to ask real nice. Steve finds you here. Finding? He won't find me. He's run out on you, Peggy. He's a dirty traitor. It says so right here in the news. He won't ever come back. It's just you and me, Peggy. Steve! Get the sheriff, Billy, fast. This is going to be a real pleasure, Burnley. <laughs> Back against the wall, Peggy. Quick, I'm going to kill you, Vining. I'm killing you for all the Americans. And maybe this will help you stand up straight. You all right, Peggy? Steve. Are you all right? Oh, you feel ordinary enough now. Now that you've used your fist. I didn't want to. I'm glad you did. <laughs> so am I. I got the sheriff, Pop. And I've got a phone call to make to my office at the Moorfield Research Station. Your office. That's right, honey. My office. for another mounting drama of action and suspense when we again bring you The Eleventh Hour.
Escape. Escape tonight to ancient Egypt. The Columbia Broadcasting System and its affiliated stations presents Escape, a new series of programs of which this, the sixth, is The Ring of Thought by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, produced and directed by William N. Robeson. Wherever the English language is spoken, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle is known for two things, his immortal character Sherlock Holmes and his unshakable belief in life beyond the grave. So great is the stature of Sherlock Holmes that Conan Doyle's earlier stories are all but forgotten. Stories like The Ring of Thought, which so clearly anticipates the author's later fascination with spiritualism. We invite you now to escape to ancient Egypt and The Ring of Thought, an adventure told in the words of John Van Siddart Smith, British Egyptologist. I arrived in Paris on the 314 Express from Dieppe and went immediately to my hotel in the Rue de Lafitte. My actions so far had worked out according to my planned schedule. I slept for exactly two hours, got up and dressed, donned a greatcoat, walked down the Avenue de l'Opera, and entered the side door of the Louvre. Once inside and amid surroundings entirely familiar to me, I made my way immediately to the Chamber of Egyptian Relics, or more specifically, to the cabinet in that chamber which contained the El Kab collection of papyri. Drawing out the particular roll I wished, I placed it on a nearby table, sat down, began to study it, when I noticed one of the museum attendants who was polishing some brasswork across the room. His face struck me as being curiously Egyptian. On sudden impulse, I decided to cross the room and speak to him. Approaching closer, I was impressed at once by the appearance of his skin, Drawn tautly across temple and cheek, it seemed as glazed and as shiny as varnished parchment, and out of narrowed slits there glowed two green and vitreous eyes, misty with a dry shininess, eyes of a kind never seen in a human head before. I I beg your pardon. I need one of the papyri from the Memphis collection. Could you tell me where it is? You'll find it in the last cabinet at the end of the room, monsieur. Hmm, thank you. Uh, you're Egyptian, aren't you? No, monsieur. I... I am a Frenchman. But, uh, Oh, I thought perhaps If that, uh, monsieur will excuse me now, I have other work to do. I went back to the table and took up the papyrus I had been studying before. But my former calmness in translating the intricate hieroglyphics was gone, and out of the depths of my mind welled a feeling of terrible familiarity. I concentrated more deeply on my studies, pushing aside those thoughts conducive to mental turmoil, and at last, worn out by the inward struggle, I fell asleep. I awoke with a start, not remembering where I was. It was quite dark for a moment. Then gradually my eyes focused on the glints of moonlight reflected from the glass tops of specimen tables, from the shiny varnish of the mummy cases. And I realized with a feeling of sudden dread that I was alone in the Egyptian room of the Museum of the Louvre, locked in for the night. and I saw at that moment, approaching through the moonlit halls, a dim yellow flame. Nearer and nearer it came until I could perceive above it, as though floating in the air, the eerie glistening face of the man I'd spoken to earlier. I shrank into the dark shadow of my corner, and he passed without seeing me, stopping before the mummy cases a few yards away. Scarcely daring to breathe, I watched him place the light on a table and begin feverishly to examine the tags on the specimens. In a moment, he gave a cry of delight, and uh, drawing one of the mummies from its resting place, laid it on the table in the full glow of the lantern and set to work. He was unwinding the wrappings from the head of the corpse. A few turns revealed a tumbled cascade of black curls, a 
a few more, the snow-white brow, then the delicate nostrils, and at last, the full, warm, passionate lips, the face of the most beautiful woman the world has ever seen. Ah, oh, ma pauvre petite, so long it has been, so very long. You must forgive me, beloved. I could hardly believe my eyes. The man was obviously in love with this mummy. After a while, he left the body, turning his attention to one of the glass cases filled with an assortment of rings. From a pocket of his garment, he'd taken a small glass bottle containing some kind of liquid, and he used this now to test the rings, rejecting them one after another. Then at last... This is it. It's the one. At last I've found it. The ring of thought. In his excitement, he dropped the bottle, and I gasped in surprise at the sudden sound. Who's there? Uh, I, I beg your pardon. So it is you. No, do not move. Uh, I, I didn't mean to spy on you. I, I fell asleep. Who are you, monsieur? I am John Van Sittart Smith, a student of Egyptology. No matter. You will observe this knife. Yes. Had I discovered you five minutes ago, monsieur, I should have slain you without a word. What? As it is now, I have found the ring. But I warn you not to interfere with me in any way. Uh, I really haven't the slightest intention of it. After all, I'm only here by accident. Perhaps. I say, you shouldn't have unwrapped that mummy, you know. It's starting to deteriorate already. Oh, my beloved. Yes, before our eyes, the lovely kind, face was crumbling, the hair falling away, the skin shriveling and cracking, oh, the lips fading. Love. The man hovered over the decaying body a moment, murmuring sorrowfully. And then he turned again. No matter. That will not make the least difference in a little while. Of what importance is the dead shell, so long as her spirit waits for me at the other side of the veil? What are you talking about? What is it you're proposing to do? Tonight, monsieur, I have ended a quest and broken at last the ancient curse. Nothing now can prevent my joining her. Uh, are you actually claiming that you... you knew her? She was Atma, daughter of the governor of Abaris. And both she and I lived in the reign of Tutmosis 3,500 years ago. You're obviously mad. Perhaps, but not in the way you think. There may be design in this, your coming here. It may be decreed that I should leave some account behind as a warning to other mortals as rash as myself. Very well, then. So be it. I am, as you surmised, an Egyptian. My name was Sasra, and my father had been the chief priest of Osiris in the great temple of Abaris which stood, in those days, upon the bubastic branch of the Nile. I was brought up in the temple and was trained in all those mystic arts and sciences known to the priesthood. Of all the mysteries that I studied, none intrigued me more than the question of life and death. And even to this question, in time, I found an answer. But for a man to live beyond his allotted span of years, Master Sastra, the gods have not so ordained it. <laughs> then perhaps they will have to revise their ordinances now that I have discovered their secret. It is not well to jest. I tremble, for though I have labored in your service for a year, I knew not the goal of your endeavors. May Osiris forgive me. Ah, oh, what a pity you look upon it this way. For I'd thought that in return for your assistance, I should grant you, too, the gift of centuries of indestructible life. I would not have it, Master Sastra. And I beg that you, too, forgo it. Forgo it? I introduced the fluid into my veins one month ago. Oh, no. 
Then you are lost indeed. Lost? <laughs> Do you call this being lost? Let's see now. My heart should be about here. Oh, that knife. No, don't. Master, you... You've killed yourself. Not at all. See? It bleeds a little. But in a while, the wound will close up. And that's all. You... It's... It's immortality. No. I shall not live forever. But for 5,000, perhaps 6,000 years... I shall be immune from all dangers of violence, poison, disease, starvation. You... you cannot die? Now, with this fluid in my veins, nothing, nothing in this world can end my life. Dothra! Dothra, are you there? Someone calls. It's Parmes, the priest of Thoth. In here, my friend. Enter. Oh, greeting, Sosra, master of sciences, and his worthy assistant. If you will excuse me, masters, I go to make my peace with Osiris. <laughs> What's wrong with your helper, Sosra? The thought of a well-nigh eternal life has frightened him into gibbering superstition. Then you still believe in the discovery? Believe in it? Parmes, my friend. Look. By the heavens, what a scar. It pierces the heart. It was done only a moment ago with this knife. Hmm? See? I can put it back in the wound. <coughs> so. You... You suffered no ill effects? None whatever. And if I... If I turn the knife in the wound, that would do you no harm? You may try it. I feel nothing. I walked last week in the snake pits by the river, was struck innumerable times. It caused no harm. By the great Anubis. Will you have it then? Out of all Egypt, I have chosen only you, my friend, to share the gift. But the choice is yours. I'd be a fool to refuse, Sosra. I'll have it, and now... What must I do? First, we must open a vein in your wrist, like this. <clears throat> oh. Then, we drip the elixir slowly into your bloodstream. Steady now. I... I don't feel anything. There is no sensation. It is done. So simple? There is nothing more? That's all. And now done, it can never be changed. It seems incredible, supernatural. It's no more than a chemical discovery, but with it, while all this about us passes away, you and I, Parmes, will live on for 50 centuries. Think of it, my friend. 5,000 years of life. 5,000 years. Only the two of us. Listen, that noise. Some procession must be passing in the street. I have an idea what it may be. Come on over to the window. Clear the road. Stand back and make way for the loveliest pearl of Thebes. She's being carried on the shoulders of slaves, Parmes. She must be some woman of rank. Her name is Atma. She's the daughter of the new governor. Her curtains are drawn back. Perhaps we'll have a look at her. Oh, Parmes. Mm hmm. Is she not beautiful? She is the most desirable the only utterly desirable woman I've ever seen in my life. Yes, I saw her yesterday at the temple. Then you're most fortunate, my friend. You've had 24 more hours to dream about her than I have had. I must know her, Parmes. I must make her love me. I'll send gifts. I'll call on her tomorrow. Oh, it has to be then. I couldn't wait any longer than tomorrow. <laughs> upon the beloved of the universe. He is Sasra, priest of the temple of Osiris. Well, bid him approach. Enter, Sasra. Oh, most beautiful of all Egypt, I cast myself at your feet. That's a noble ambition. But wouldn't it be much better to sit here beside me and watch the fish in the fountain? Much better. You will all withdraw, except you, my girl. Play something for us, at a distance. Well, Sasra, for so I understand you're called, am I to deem this an official visit by a master of the temple? Oh, Atma, my beloved. That is, no, it is not official. Oh? Perhaps then you wish to see my father on personal business of your own. Oh, no, no. 
I shall pay my respects to him at some other time. Then could it be I you've come to see? Yes, yes. And since you've said the visit's not official, your reason must be a personal one. Oh, it is. Well, what is it? Atma, I have known women who are famed for their beauty throughout the valley of the Nile. But not one, not all of them, are so lovely as you. How thoughtful of you to come here and tell me. Atma, I've no wish to intrude my desires, my hopes, beyond such extent as you may wish to hear. But, oh, I'm finding this very difficult. <laughs> Sasra, I've been told that you're a master of science, that you've unlocked the secrets of the universe, learned all the mysteries of nature itself. Your informants have been most generous. Yes, I'm inclined to think so. What? Because you've discovered nothing at all about such a simple thing as a woman's heart. What do you mean? I come from Thebes. And the women of Thebes are warm-blooded, passionate. And we know what we want. Atma. I saw you first three days ago. Why do you think I told my bearers to carry me down that street beneath your window? And so, miracle of all miracles, Atma loved me. Worshipping the very ground her feet had trod upon, I lived through those glorious weeks. And with it all, our love grew apace. But one thing bore heavily upon my mind, and I came to speak of it more often to my beloved as we sat and talked by the fountain in her garden. Look, Sasra, see how the stars shine from the water? Yes, Atma. More lovely even than their glow in the heavens. Are they very old, the stars? Very old, beloved. As old as time. And they'll go on gleaming there. Long years after you and I are gone and forgotten. Atma, my dearest. We've talked of this before, and I know it distresses you to think of it. But... No, Sasra. Tonight everything is beautiful. We shall not talk of death. Not of death, but of life. They're only counterparts of one another. Oh, if we could only live together, grow old together and die in the same instant. But how much better to live and love 5,000 years? Will you not do it? Does so long a time seem too great for the love you feel for me? Beloved, no. The time would pass in an instant, and the loss then be no easier born than now. Then why draw back? Will you not take the elixir now, tonight? I'm afraid, Sasra. We'll anger the gods. We will outlive the gods. They will have their revenge. Whatever occurred, we'd be together. Yes, I've thought of that. Were it not so, I'd not even consider doing it. Then you'll do it. Atma, you'll do it. I need more time, only a little more to assure myself. How much? Tonight, Sasra. Give me tonight. Every hour you live without the elixir is another hazard. All right, then. Tonight. And may Isis herself guard over you until the fluid courses in your veins. And so, on that accursed night, I went to my chambers and slept. And while I slept, the moon of Isis shone over the delta of the Nile. Shone but to light as foul a scene as was ever done on Earth. Some hours had passed Master away. Master Sosra, Master Sosra, awaken, Master, awaken mm -hmm. at once. You know, who is it? Oh, what a terrible thing has transpired Let me turn up this the lamp. night. You, you're one of Atma's slaves. Why do you come here? Oh, Master, Master. What has happened? What's the matter? Speak. It is she, the light of the world. Tell me what has happened to her. Master, Master, brigands came in the night. She... She is dead. You lie. You lie. Oh, Sasra, the slave speaks the truth. Parmes, my friend. What foul jokes behind these words of his? It's not a joke. Atma is dead. You, slave, depart from us. Yes, masters. By your gracious leave, I depart. Such a thing cannot be. Oh, of course. 
The two of you planned it together, sought to frighten me out of my wits. It's very amusing, really. But I was terrified for a moment. Atma no longer lives. She was stabbed to death only a short while ago. No. Oh, no, no. She can't be dead. She is dead, Sosra, and for all eternity. I must go to her. Something. Surely something can be done. I killed her. What is it? What has happened? I killed her. Oh. I struck her through the heart with this very knife. You? You, Parmes? Why? Because she loved you. Why? And because I loved her. You? My friend. She would not look at me. And for that, you would lose her to both of us forever? To both of us, Sosra? I think not. By the living Osiris, give me that knife. That's it. Strike. <clears throat> uh, again. <clears throat> Here's the heart. Here, strike. <coughs> again and again, Sostra. Wait. What foolishness. I cannot kill you. You're wrong, Sostra. You have killed me. Those were grievous blows. But the fluid, that cursed elixir of life, it runs in your veins as well as mine. True. But in mine is also the antidote. You lie. There is no antidote. Yes, day and night. These many weeks I've worked and I found it. You couldn't have. You. <clears throat> Is there more of it? Yes, a very little. But you'll never find it. Where is it? Tell me where it is. In the ring, Sasra. In the ring of Thoth. And you'll never find I it. I will. I will. I must. Go on. Live. Live your 50 centuries. And every hour of them, think. It was your hand that struck me down with the same knife that took her from you. Think while I go to join her. Oh, no. You're not dead. You're not! No! 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 For months, I searched the papers, test tubes, and the chemical flasks in the chambers of the dead priest of Thoth. Searched and found nothing. I sifted the sands where he'd walked, questioned his slaves and servants, and learned nothing. Every moment of my life, my terrible and unwanted life was devoted to an unceasing hunt for the ring of thought and all to no avail and in time a horde of barbarians overran the city of Abaris and the sands of the desert buried forever the last of my hopes <laughs> And so began the deadly march of the centuries. How can you know how terrible a thing time is? You, who've experienced only the narrow course between the cradle and the grave. I've floated down the whole stream of history. I have traveled in all lands. And I have dwelt with all nations. Every tongue is the same to me. I need not tell you how slowly the centuries drifted by. Centuries without end. Years without number. And so I came to be one day, a few weeks past, in San Francisco where I came across a certain item in a newspaper. Among recent discoveries in Lower Egypt is an unopened mummy case containing, according to the inscription on the outside, the body of the daughter of the governor of Abaris in the days of Tutmosis. In the same burial crypt, dropped into a crevice between the stones, was found a large platinum ring of singular design. Both specimens have been sent for examination to the Louvre in Paris. <laughs> So, I presume you came here to Paris, obtained this position of attendant in the Louvre with the idea... Only yesterday, Monsieur Smith, 
As you may imagine, I had little difficulty in convincing the director of my knowledge of Egyptian relics. The ring, then. The one I saw you remove from the case is the ring of Thoth? Without question. You've discovered how the ring must be used? The secret is obvious. See, the stone is hollow, and drops of liquid move within it. Have you considered the possibility that this uh, antidote may not perform the function which has been claimed for it? It will, monsieur. And there'll be no need of a knife to strike me down. My death was due in a time long past. And only this damnable fluid that runs through my veins supports the weight of my years. I delay no longer. I go to join her where she waits for me in death. No, don't. Oh. Too late. I've broken the gem. I've taken the antidote. I stood and watched him with a terrible fascination, but without pity and without compassion. He turned away from me and reeled toward the mummy he'd left on the table across the room. But even as he turned, the parchment skin of his face cracked and shredded. Discolored lips shriveled away from the yellow teeth. The vitreous eyes withered into nubs of formless plasm. And the full weight of his 3,500 years descended on him in an instant. I left that room of death and walked over the marble floors toward the exit, my footsteps echoing through the empty halls, even as they had echoed for so long in the corridors of time. And I wondered as I walked if Sosra knew now what I knew, that the antidote in the ring of Thoth can bring death to the body, but not to the soul. And I wondered in what cloak of flesh his spirit now dwelt, just as I, Pami's priest of Thoth, had for the last 40 years of my 3,500 dwelt in the body of John Vansittart Smith. and so red. Well, now, he's only two days old. But he doesn't look a bit like either his father or me. Give him time, my dear. All babies look pretty much alike when they're first born. Well, I don't know. It, His eyes are... Oh, it's silly, of course, but he looks like an Egyptian. <laughs> Produced and directed by William N. Robeson, The Ring of Thoth by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle was adapted for radio by Les Crutchfield with Jack Webb as Sorcerer, Thomas Freebairn Smith as Van Siddart Smith, and Joan Banks as Atma. The special musical score was conceived and conducted by Cy Fewer. Escape is presented by the Columbia Broadcasting System and its affiliated stations each week at this time. Next week, we invite you to escape to a raft in the South Pacific with John Russell in his unforgettable story of human frailty, The Fourth Man. And so good night until next week at this time, when again it will be time to escape. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. never say that anything is wrong, that it has no value. 
That's not true. There are things that are wrong. Yes, some things are just plain wrong. No rightness about them. Atomic war is one of those things. If we get started on a real atomic war... You see, ordinary war destroys men. Atomic war can destroy humanness by producing mutations that aren't human. But there's another thing that's wrong, too. And that's the wrongness of fooling yourself. Not merely others, but fooling yourself. And that's tonight's story. And you say the annual budget of this institution is $8 million, Dr. Holly? That's right, Senator Bryan. $8 million a year for the care and feeding of... of... The freaks, Doctor? Oh, we try never to think of them as freaks, Senator. And never to speak of them that way. Some of them have unusually sensitive hearing. Yes, but they are... Uh... Well, they're mutants, Senator. Genetic sports created by radioactive fallout. You might say they're martyrs to the criminal stupidity of the 20th century. And is it compulsive for a, a mutant to live in an institution like this? I confess I'm not completely familiar with the legal aspect. Compulsory? No, Senator. It's not compulsory. But it's often simpler for a mutant to live within these walls than out there in the world at large. So I can understand that. Eighty percent of them have come here voluntarily. And the rest? Committed by relatives who couldn't stand the sight of them. But, uh, come, let me show you some of the patients, Senator. That's Anna over there. You'll notice I didn't bother knocking. Anna doesn't hear sound. When she wants privacy, she just bolts her door. But, uh, uh, what is she doing? Thinking. That's all, just, just thinking? Well, that's all she ever does, Senator. She's uh, busy working on a new cosmological theory. Come, Senator. We're disturbing her concentration. Let's, let's try another room. Now, there are many different types of mutations, of course, Senator. Hardly any two are alike. And some of our patients are simply physically deformed. You know, an extra limb, a strange texture of skin, differences like that. But others are more or less normal physically, but have unusual mental ability. And still others, like Anna here, well, they're both deformed and mentally unusual. Now, in this room, we have a pair of remarkable mutants. Dr. Holly, uh, what's that coming up the hall toward us? It's Mary, one of our more interesting patients. Let them wander around the hall. This isn't a prison, Senator. Uh, hello there, Merrick. Where are you heading? Taking a little walk, Dr. Holly. This is Senator Bryan. He's paying us a visit here today. He's on the Senate Appropriations Committee. How interesting. I'm leaving here, Dr. Holly, right now. Leaving? But uh, you haven't been out of here in ten years, Mary. I've decided to give the world another chance. You know the rules, Merrick. If you volunteer to come in as a patient, you have to give three months' notice. Now, that way we can prepare you for life in the outside world. I'm well, leaving right now, Doctor. Ten minutes after I'm gone, you'll forget all about this. You remember there was once a Clyde Merrick here, but according to your records, he was discharged today, September 4th, 2019. You go directly to the recording computer and make the change. And as for you, Senator, whatever your name, you will have no recollection whatever of this conversation. And when you return to Washington, you will do your best to see that Dr. Hawley's appropriation is increased. Is all that clear? Good. Goodbye, Dr. Hawley. Thank you for everything. Uh, very well, Senator. Let's uh, let's continue our little tour now. Uh, suppose I let you see our recreational therapy wing now. Oh, it's all right, Doctor. I, I don't feel very well. Could we sit down and rest for a while? The oddest sensation in my head. It's as if, uh, as if I fell asleep for a few minutes. I had a very strange dream. A young man talking to me. Maybe a little fresh air. It's rather warm in here. Yes, yes, yes. Fresh air would be good. Straight through that car, it'll take you to the courtyard. I'll, I'll be with you in just a moment. I I have to stop in at the office and make an entry on a patient's record. Uh, something I've been meaning to do for a long time. I keep forgetting it. 
I'll, I'll be with you in a moment, Senator. You know, the danger you can't stop is a danger that, by its very nature, keeps you from seeing that it's there or knowing that you've met it. That's a hard one to stop. It camouflages itself so that you don't even know you encountered it. Driving to town, Miss? Oh, uh, yes. Yes, I am, but... Uh, I never pick up strangers when I'm driving alone. But why did I stop the car? You will give me a lift. Um, uh, I... Sure. Climb in. Over here, next to me. Thanks, I was sure you'd change your mind. This is an awfully lonely part of the country to be hitching a ride in. Where are you coming from? You see that building up on the hill with the brick fence around it? Yes. Do you know what that is? Some sort of government hospital, isn't it? Close. It's a sanctuary for mutants. That's where I was coming from. From the mutant sanctuary? But uh, are you a... A mutant? Do I look like one? I don't know. You look... You look... Uh, how do I look? I look perfectly normal, don't I? Yeah, you... You look perfectly normal in... In every way. Tell me how I look to you. You're tall, blonde, blue eyes, broad shoulders, nice smile. You'd say I was good looking? Yes. Yes, I'd say you were quite handsome. Thank you. But what's your name? Lisa Roberts. You? My name is Clyde Merrick. Oh, you must work at the sanctuary, then. Yes, that's right. I I work there. This is my afternoon off, and I, I thought I'd hitch a ride into town for for some fun. Well, you're lucky I stopped for you. I'm going all the way into town. You know, it's, it's funny, too. I, I never usually stop for strangers. Tony says I shouldn't. Well, who is Tony? My fiancé. You're going to get married, then. <laughs> That's what having a fiancé usually means. Yeah, we're, we're getting married in December. Going for a long cruise on our honeymoon. W what do you do, Lisa? Do? Oh, oh, I'm a dancer. Maybe you've seen me on TV. I'm usually on every Saturday night. Not that anyone ever remembers a girl from the chorus. I don't look at TV much, I'm afraid. Is this Tony of yours... A dancer, too? Yes, he's the leading man of the show. You love him very much, don't you? You could never think of marrying anyone else. You do talk strangely sometimes. I guess it's because you're around those crazy mutants all the time. Of course I love him very much. Well, what do you think? How do you feel about mutants, Lisa? Just the way everyone else does, I suppose. What is that supposed to mean? Well, I, I feel sort of pity for them. But still, pity and all makes me feel creepy to think about people with two heads and all. Well, none of them have two heads, Lisa. That particular mutation doesn't survive to adulthood. Most of the really strange ones die off the first few weeks of life. No, even so, I've seen pictures of them. Oof. It's a good thing they keep themselves cooped up in their sanctuaries. Good for them and good for us. Well, sometimes they leave the sanctuaries... They try to live like normal people. But they aren't normal people. Sometimes they can convince others that they are normal. We can be very convincing, Lisa. We? I'm a mutant, Lisa. I'm casting a mental projection that hides my true appearance. Oh, no. Leave me alone. Get out of the car! Oh, slow down. I won't hurt you. I'm, I'm very friendly... I'm a lonely person, Lisa, and, and you're so beautiful. You're not afraid of me, are you? I'm 
not afraid of you. Of course you aren't. You like me. You like me very much. I'm tall and broad-shouldered, and you think I'm handsome. Very handsome. More handsome than your fiancé, Tony. Of course. You're wondering what you ever saw in Tony, aren't you? You're starting to forget you ever had any liking for him at all. I can't imagine how I could ever let myself think I cared for him. You're forgetting him rapidly. You don't even know who Tony is now. But you know who I am, don't you? Yes. Yes, of course. And you love me. You've only known me for a few minutes, but despite that, you've fallen deeply in love with me. Haven't you, Lisa? Yes. I love you, Clyde. And I love you, Lisa. Will you marry me, Lisa? Of course, Clyde. Yes, I'll marry you. Darling. <laughs> It isn't really Clyde Merrick's fault. He's not responsible for what he is. Uh, He was made that way by the genetic mutations caused by too much atomic warfare. It isn't his fault. But that doesn't make him tolerable, does it? He is an intolerable menace. Oh, that was a wonderful meal, darling. You know, I don't know how you did it. All those people waiting in line for tables and... The head waiter just took you right over to the spot. I have ways of being persuasive. Oh, I see. You love me? Of course, yes. We'll be married tomorrow and go far, far away. Rent a cabin somewhere and stay there for months and months and just read and fish and sleep. <laughs> oh, it sounds wonderful. It is wonderful. Just the two of us. I can't wait. You're not worried about Tony, are you? Tony? I don't know anyone named Tony, do I? No, you... You don't know anyone named Tony. Come on, let's get out of here. If you say so, darling. Where will we go? Your car. We'll we'll drive out into the country. You can't see the stars. You haven't paid the check. It doesn't matter. If you see them trying to stop me. Well, no, but... I can eat for free any time. You see? They're smiling goodbye to us. anywhere? Take the road you were on this morning when you met me. Of course. Lisa. What is it, dear? Do you really love me? Really and truly love? I love you, Clyde. No. No, you don't. Not at all. Oh, whatever do you mean? Oh, it's no good. It isn't real. It's just another thought. I don't understand. You don't love me. Not really. I've made you think you do, and you say you do, but that isn't enough. Every time I'd kiss you, every time I'd hold you in my arms, I'd know you were nothing but a puppet playing the role I made you play. Do you call that love? Clyde, you're talking nonsense. I wish I were. I thought I might be able to find some fulfillment outside the sanctuary, but I was wrong. What good is it all? I, I can fool everyone. Everyone except myself. Lisa, tell me again. How do I look to you? Well, tall, very good-looking, blonde hair, kind of wavy, regular features. In other words, as handsome as a video star. Mm. All right, stop the car. Stop it? Why? Because I want you to. Well? Ever since I left the sanctuary this morning, I've... I've been projecting a false appearance. It's a power of mine. Something special I have, thanks to the otherwise unkind providence. I'm going to turn that projection off now, Lisa. 
Let you have a look at me as I really am. As I look without the benefit of hypnotic trickery. Oh, no! Oh, no! It's the face, those eyes, the skin. Everything's all right now. You're starting to forget. In a moment, you'll have forgotten it. There. All better. How do you feel? Uh, uh, all right, Clyde. Good. But you see, Lisa, I was wrong. I thought if I left the sanctuary at last, disguising myself as one of the normals, I could be happier. I could... But it would be a synthetic happiness. You can't live on nothing but cotton candy, Lisa. Start the car. Yes, Drive up the hill to your left. And that's it, right, right up to those big gates. Stop here. This is the sanctuary. I'm back home now. Home to stay where I belong. Clyde, I'm I'm all mixed up. I don't know what's happening. You're going to turn your car around and drive home, Lisa. You're going to go home and go to bed. And when you wake up in the morning, you'll have no recollection of today at all. You'll simply have lost a day. And you'll marry your Tony, and you'll be happy with him. Is that clear, Lisa? Yes, Clyde. All right, now. You're beginning to forget me already. Say goodbye to me, Lisa. Goodbye, Clyde. That's right. No, don't, don't kiss me. Merrick was. But while he could fool all those around him, he didn't fool himself. This program will be interrupted in the event of important news developments. This is Five After the Hour by Les Weinrath. The strings sing, blow softly on the reeds, mute the trumpets, for this is the theme. Hey, wait a minute, hold it. Important memo from the front office. From HLA. Right, listen. What about comedy variety shows scheduled for five after the hour? Yeah, but the show is set for tonight. How can we make a change at the last... Sorry! Emergency memo from front office. This is a must. Comedy variety program must go on tonight. But the show is rehearsed and we're on the air. What do you this mean? This is it. It's in his own handwriting. What do you mean? What it's it's in the red ink what? and it's underlined. And it says... Well... Get the writer. Get the director. Get the producer. Here he comes now. All three of them. Well, Weinrock? You heard what HLA wants? 
How are you going to get out of this one? Yeah, what about the comedy variety show, huh? Yeah, well, well, don't uh, just stand there like a, like a writer, director, producer. Say something. Yeah, like H.L.A. says. Well? He's typing. It's very good. Yeah, hold it, hold it. Stand by for comedy variety show. Huh? Title for show. Announcer to read. Les Weinrot presents The Tickle Rib, a comedy variety show. Caesar Petrillo and the orchestra over the show with June is busted out all over. You boys. And now, and now, what comes next? Well, he's typing again. Yeah. Call Variety. Get comedy writers, stooges, and star comic. HLA isn't going to approve of this. He certainly isn't. Tell HLA and front office I have but one, but one. Well, what happened? I got his finger stuck in the E. Hey, there. Hey, he's loose. Tell HLA in front office I have but one typewriter to give to my network and call Variety now. Variety? Hunt warbling. Hey, look, Bill, I'm calling for five after the hour. We're in a jam. We need comedy writers, stooges, and a star comic in a hurry. Don't be hicks. Writers, stooges, stars, nicks. All gone to picks. So guess comb sticks. Good flicks. What'd he say? Any help, Bob? Oh, what's the word? Free translation of conversation with Variety. Hunt says all writers, stooges, and star comics have gone to pictures. He suggests we comb rural areas. And he concluded by saying good flicks. Good what? Goodbye, Variety style. Well? Well? Send out scouts to tour rural areas for writers and stooges. Prepare to make a comedian. Bring in following list of articles. Potassium sulfate, H2O, pickled herring, weedy spinach, acid, acid, laughing gas, one pickled rib, Joe Miller joke book, one toupee and old car, preferably a Maxwell. We're three witches, double, double, toil and trouble. I am burn all the trouble. Woo, woo, woo. <laughs> Watch out what you're doing with that broomstick. The writers and stooges are here. And so is the corn they brought with them. Do you think this is going to work? Well, it better or HLA will be tagging another scalp on his wall. Uh-oh. It looks like it's done. Get that bottle ready. We're about to launch a new comic. Presenting that man of mirth, that master of mimicry, that newest atomic eruption of the ark, the sock, the belly laugh, Arno Lester! He's launched. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, folks. This is Arno Lester. Tonight, as I was coming down to the studio, nothing happened. <laughs> it's a twist, huh? I didn't run into a single person. I didn't hear a single gag, honest. Nobody asked me for an autograph, and no one paid the slightest attention to me. I got into a cab. I told the driver where I wanted to go. He told me where to go. <laughs> so I walked down. It was wonderful, just like not being in radio, which 
I have a hunch I will soon not be. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Arnold, old boy. I'm Tom Moore, your announcer. <laughs> How flattering. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, tell me, Tom, uh, what did you do before you became an announcer? I was a milkman. <laughs> The early hours got me. I lost weight like crazy. Condensed milk, man. Ah! Then you came into radio. You came into radio after that. You know, I'm very happy to have you on my show. Oh, thank you, champ. And say, yes. Would you mind calling me Bubbles? Bubbles? Why? Because I'm bursting with joy. <laughs> Hear me! Ring me up. Call me Rinkle. Oh, dear, dear. My announcer, five pounds more, and he'd make Don Wilson look like a thin man's Tom Moore. I wonder who else I've got on the show. Yes? Arnold Lester? Yes, I'm Arnold Lester. I'm one of your new gag writers. Name's Charlie. Charlie, and what would you like me to call you? Charlie. That's nice. I used to be a barber. How interesting. I'll be around to see you when I grow a head of hair. Oh, I gave up barbering. Couldn't take it anymore. Tonic poisoning or the once over lightly blues? Oh, I like barbering all right. Was the talking that got me. The customers never stopped talking. Felt they had to entertain me. Used to bring me all the new stories. Maybe I should learn to cut hair. The only piece I had was when I had a close shave or a mustache trim in the chair. And uh, what finally broke the camel's mm -hmm. hair brush, Charlie? Had a Van Dyke beard in the chair. Is that so? Was just giving him the final snip. That's a delicate point, you know. I must ask. <laughs> I, uh, I must uh, must ask Monty Woolley about that. He tried to tell me the one about the canary that got drunk. I couldn't stand it anymore. I cut the Van Dyke off. You debearded him, huh? Yes. How was I to know he had more jaw than beard? <laughs> I gave up barbering after that. I understand that. Then the man without the beard gave up chinning. Mm -hmm. And now you've come to write gags for me. Thank you. I thought it was bad, too. And uh, you say you know all the funny stories? Every oh, single the... one of That's them. fine, fine. But I don't like them. Huh? You, you don't like them? I hate jokes. When I hear a funny joke, I get so upset, I cry. You cry? Now, come, 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 Charlie. They're not all that bad. Now, <laughs> take, for instance, the one about the man who had a, had a mouse in the no, dress pocket. No, no, not that one. No, please, not that one. I can't stand it. It's so funny. I cry, fucking so. Goodbye, Mr. Lester. I'll be back after I think of something sad so I can <laughs> laugh. Fine writer. That's a wonderful writer. If I'm funny, he busts into tears. If I'm sad, he laughs. <laughs> I'll trap him, that's what I'll do. I'll be sad. I'll try it out. Oh, more. <laughs> oh. Yeah, Jim. Look, more, more. I'm going to think of something sad. Yeah. Uh, Rosnops. <laughs> Rosnop? <laughs> Sponsor spelled backwards. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> wonderful. Say, he's here. Who's here? Rosnop. <laughs> I'll go get him. Oh, shut. Nothing works for me. I got a darned old sponsor. I mean, a Rothnop. Well, well, well. How do, how do, how do? I'm the senior partner of Rothnops, Rothnops, and Rothnops. Good night. Thank you. <laughs> my two brothers and I run the company. And when I'm alone, I have to speak for my two brothers. That's why I say everything three times, three times, three times. You know, it'd be much easier if you had three heads, wouldn't it? Uh, what do you manufacture, Mr. Rosnops? We make the name three labeling device. Among our satisfied customers, we number three on a match, three of a kind, three musketeers. How interesting. I have one of your products myself. Three grows in Brooklyn. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Had quite a time with that one, raised it from a thriftlet. But our real smash was three little fishes. Created a sensation in the fish industry. I remember, wrecked the filter fish market. <laughs> well, I must be going now. I must be going. Have to meet my brothers. Bye, goodbye, goodbye. Goodbye. I'll be freeing you. <laughs> Rosnops. Oh, well. Hey, more. Come in. Hiya, Dopey. This is where I sing. You, you sing? I don't do pratfalls, bud. Can't help. I'm the Bobby appeal in this show, the swoon department. Yeah, division. Just a minute now, just a minute. How can you be the singer on this program? On every other comedy show, the singer's a nice, meek, unassuming, and somewhat dumb character who, who says silly things. And then the comedian says funny things back to him, and then the, the comedian gets the laughs. What cooks with the other shows, Arno, is not my racket. On this show, I make with the ox, I give out with the giggle goo, and I get the laugh. Who says so? Rostop says so. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah? Did he say it three times? He said it three times. Oh, yeah? Well, go ahead and sing. 
Ladies and gentlemen, our singer will vocalize three for two. I'll get even with him. I'll announce the wrong song. <laughs> I knew someone like you could love me. I wish I knew you place no one above me. Did I mistake this for a real But only you can answer And if you don't care Why let me hope and pray so Don't lead me on And if I'm a fool, just say so should I keep dreaming on or just forget you? What shall I do? What shall I do? Buddy Clark, who henceforth will have no more speaking lines on this program, Rosnops. Hey, you Arnold Lester? Yes, I'm Arnold Lester, comedian, rock on tour, and general all around funny man. Oh, shucks, don't apologize. Oh, well, what can I do for you? Can't do a thing for me, sonny. I feel fine. Chipper's a hopper, spire's a goat, and Frisky's a coat. <laughs> <laughs> and oh. <laughs> Kind of an old coat. <laughs> well, look, won't you tie up all your little friends and have a seat? I will not. I've been hired to write your plays. Well? I'm looking at you. And I'm looking at you. And you know something? I think I'm looking better than you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. I like a man that looks like myself. The two of you a, must be a, very happy. A man full of fire, a man full of poetry, a man full of... <laughs> <laughs> Man full of vitamin B1. Now, careful, Bob. Sir. Don't you care for me, you whippersnapper. I've written a great play for tonight. It's a play for a lady killer. Well, look, will you pretend I'm a reasonable facsimile and go on? <laughs> I killed him with his play in 1900, wowed him with it in 1910, slayed him with it in 1920. And we'll dig him up with it in 1945. Now, wipe your chin and go on. Don't you rush me, Sonny boy. I made William Gillette wait for three months. I made Lionel Barrymore wait for six months. Of course, he was just a child after. Then. Yeah, it was a, <laughs> it was a real pretty little fella had long curls. He used to talk baby talk. He'd say, "Now, Doc, you kill them." Oh, I wish Doc <laughs> killed them. I, mean, really. I don't believe in doctors, no sir. You know, I never been sick a day, not a single day in my whole life. <laughs> life till now. Here's the. Oh. Oh, excuse me, will you? I know, got a date with a little chick. Come on, baby, we're going to... <laughs> oh, dear. Ladies and gentlemen, the Arno Lester Mummers will present a play with snappy dialogue, snappy situations, and snappy comedy. Directly after the next snappy number by Cesar Petrello and his snappy seven Rosnops. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
And now, now the Arno Lester Mummers present an original play. This is called an original play because it was originally presented in 1900, 1910, 1920, and so forth and so forth. Now, I'm going to play the lead, a dashing, handsome young lover who smashes hearts right and left. Now, the Arno Lester Mummers in The Picture of Dorian Green. <laughs> Still, Dorian, in trying to finish painting your picture. If you persist in squirming, I should jolly well paint you with two heads. Ripping, ripping, I've always wanted a twin. <laughs> <laughs> Capital! <laughs> you are a witch! <laughs> rather, rather, and I'm only a half trying. <laughs> <laughs> now, there, a final touch from my palette. It's slipping. But, yes, it is. <laughs> And now it is complete. <laughs> My masterpiece. Girl. <laughs> How lifelike. No, not true. Not true. Tell me, tell me, old boy. Uh, tell me, old boy. What shall you call it? You call it? Call it? Yes, call it. Your palette isn't doing so good, is it? Oh, well. I uh, shall name it after you. I shall call it the picture of Dorian Green. <laughs> Low, low dive. But is it a, is it a very low dive? A very, very low dive. Good, good, fellow. good. I, I want to plunge deep into life. No shallow dives for me. Good, eh? <laughs> Capital. <laughs> you can be completely dissolute. You will remain unchanged. Only my picture will bear the mark. But Tom, come, come, since it's a low French dive... Shouldn't we speak French, old boy? Rather. Oh, rather. We. Oh. Right, French gentleman. Hello, Garkin. Who oh, capital oh. fooled him completely? Yeah. I know. <laughs> well, what is your pleasure? Will you have wine, song, or... Uh, I think we'll have... Uh, I think we'll have a touch of... Uh, Ask him to make it for two, old boy. Can't cluck, you know, of a pallet. <laughs> rather, rather. Uh, Garçon, bring us two bottles. French, you know. Bring us two bottles as the orchestra to play us two numbers and invite two. Two, two bottles for the French peasants, two musics, and also two beautiful... <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, buddy, I told you, get around, don't I, sonny? <laughs> oh, Rosnops. Hey. Oh, nothing, old boy. Cursing to myself in French. Oh. Come, the ladies. Hello, baby. Hello. Hello, Tootsie. Hello, beautiful. Come, my baby, sit close to me. I will say sweet things to you. I will talk soft to you. I will whisper small nothings in your ear. Mm, oui, is this a lie? Then I will take you for a ride in the moonlight. I will park the car. I will... You'll run out of gas. I know you. I remember you. You are Dirty Dorian Green. <laughs> So it was. Dorian Green touched the very depths of life, tasted of every thrill. And yet he remained untouched. Only his picture carried the sordid marks of his evil life. And then one day, he stood in front of that picture. Hello there. Hello there. <laughs> I am free. Free to do as I like, who are you? <laughs> you bit of canvas. You must grow old and wrinkled. Dorian. Yes. Do you think it's quite sporty? Sporty. I have no model. None at all. Then this is quite hopeless. Quite. I mean quite. And I shall continue to grow older and older while you remain a perennial youth. Quite. Very well. Then there is one last request I have to make. 
Herbert Lipsch. Old boy. When I am an old, grey and wrinkled cousin, will you please tell my brother? Your brothers? Melvin and Ivan Rathnab. Rathnab! Yes, tell them I said you're fired, fired, fired. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you have just heard the picture of Dorian Green, as dramatized by the Arno Lester Mummers. In a moment, Arno will be back. Hold everything! Emergency memo from the front office. From HLA? Listen, listen! Continue with five after the hour. Have been reading wrong schedule. HLA. Well, don't stand there, Weinrod. Do something. He's typing again. Uh, last will and testament. Being of sound mind and sound mind. Sound mind. Sound mind. The Tickled Rib was written, directed, and produced by Les Weinrod, who also conjured up the character of Arno Lester. Appearing on this program were Sherman Mark, Charles Irving, Buddy Clark, Norman Gottschalk, Arnold Robertson, Fran Allen, Mary Lou Newmeyer, Tom Moore, and Ken Nordine. Original music was composed by Sal Stocko, and the orchestra was under the direction of Cesar Petrello. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Stay tuned now for adventure and excitement in the world of the future. It's entertainment for the entire family produced right here in Kalamazoo. There is no margin of safety along the rim of a frontier. There can't be any until a way is made for those who come later. Until then, the penalty for mistakes is a grim one. The laws of physical nature operate with irrevocable uncertainty, leaving no room for mercy, kindness, or sentimentality. In space, life becomes a cold equation, and the equal sign is often followed by death. Join us now for a voyage into another dimension. A journey into a realm as infinite and limitless as time itself. Our destination, the farthest reaches of the imagination. WMUK Special Projects presents Future Tales. Now we go forward in time to the year 4,185, when giant spacecraft cruise the galaxies. Our setting, the galactic cruiser Stardust. Our story, Cold Equations, by Tom Godwin. You sent for me, Commander? Sit down, Barton. Was something wrong? We just got an emergency distress call from the Territorial Space Station on Woden. You'll have to help. Oh, Woden, that's in the Crab Nebula, isn't that's it? That's right. There are two exploration parties there on Manning's continent. Eight men each. Uh -huh. They've got Cala fever on one of them and no serum. Uh oh. And I thought this was going to be a nice, quiet passenger ride. Computers are working out your payload and your course right now. In exactly ten minutes, we'll launch your distress ship from our port side. Okay, I'll get her ready. One thing. Oh, what's that? Woden is at the maximum pay limit for an emergency distress ship. Figuring the weight of the serum, we'll be able to give you just enough fuel to land on Manning's continent. If you make it on the first pass. Otherwise, you will burn out in midair. Uh -huh. Standard procedure. Report to launching control. All right. Good luck, Barton. Oh, thanks. 
Uh, uh, by the way. Yes? Uh, when can I expect to be picked up? We'll make a stop for you on the run back to Earth sometime next year. You'll be notified by radio. Okay. Sorry, we can't make it soon. Well, that's what happens when you sign on for EDS work. I'll see you next year, Commander. Down in the hull of the Stardust, the crew was working frantically to get the EDS, the emergency distress ship, ready. Mechanics and technicians were swarming all over the place. The girls in inspector's uniforms were checking the gauges in the supply cabinet. And nine minutes later, the exact course was in the computer. The serum was stowed in my supply cabinet, and little EDS 4G3 was ready to be born into space. I don't remember how long it was afterwards that I first noticed something wrong. Maybe an hour, maybe two. There was nothing to show it except the needle on the heat gauge. It was on zero when we left the stardust, and now I noticed that it had crept up towards the 30 mark. That meant that something inside the ship was radiating heat. That something was in the supply closet, and it was alive. All right, come out, whoever or whatever you are. If you don't come out in five seconds, I'm going to blast you. One, two, two. Well, I'll be... Hello, I'm Mary Lee Cross. Well, what are you doing in there? I'm a stowaway. Oh, my God. Well, what's the matter? Do I have to pay a fine or something? Well, what are you doing here? I want to see my husband. He's with the government survey crew on Woden. I haven't seen him since he left Earth four years okay, ago. Okay, but whatever made you hide on my ship? I had a job waiting for me. I'm Amira. But I heard you were going to Woden, and there was plenty of room, so I hid. Oh, I know I'd be breaking some kind of rule, but what's one little rule? Ha, uh, what's one little rule? H amount of fuel will power an EDS with a mass of M safely to its destination. H amount of fuel will not power an EDS with a mass of M plus X safely to its destination. Uh, how could she be expected to know? She was 5'2 with brown curly hair and a faint sweet smell of perfume. She was 5'2 and she smelled like apple blossoms. And her name was X in an equation that would have to be balanced. Come in, EDS. Come in. This is Barton, emergency distress pilot 4G3. Give me Commander Delhart. I have an emergency message. This is Delhart. What is it? At 0800 hours, I discovered a stowaway aboard my ship. Stowaway? Yes, sir. Well, have you notified ship's records? Not yet, sir know the regulations as well as I do. Of course I know the regulations. That's why I'm calling. Barton, what's going on? Sir, this this is a girl, a young woman. Oh. She wanted to see her husband on Woden. She didn't know what she was doing. I see. I wondered, sir. Uh, maybe the cruiser could change course or something. I'm afraid not. We're hundreds of light years apart now. We have a limited supply of fuel ourselves. With 900 passengers. Is there any chance? No. Okay, Skipper. Better get the information to ship's records. Okay. Martin. Skipper? Sorry. Yeah, sure. You cut acceleration, didn't you? Yes. Why? Save fuel for a while. How did you manage to stow away? I was taking a language lesson in Mamiramese from a girl in the inspection corps, and the order came for your trip. I just went along on an impulse. It was easy. I'll be a model prisoner, I promise. Oh, if you were only a thief or a spy, it would make it easier. Make what easier? <laughs> Nothing. Forget it. Why couldn't she have been somebody with some ulterior motive? A, a fugitive hoping to lose himself in a whole new world. A crackpot with a mission. Why did she have to be a woman? A beautiful, kind, trusting woman. Start up. Barton, EDS, 4G3. Go ahead, 4G3. Identify stowaway. Give me your identification disc, Miss Cross. Here? Why? Well, it's for ship's records. Uh, identification number T8374. One moment. This is for the gray card, of course. Yes. 
I'll need the pertinent data. I'll tell you later. That's highly irregular. Well, then we'll do it in a highly irregular manner. The subject is a young woman. She's listening to everything that's said. Are you capable of understanding that? No. Go ahead, 4G3. Number T8374Y54. Name, Mary Lee Cross. Female. Married. Born July 7, 4160. Good Lord, you're only a child. Height, five foot two, weight 110, hair brown, eyes blue, complexion light, blood type O, original destination, Port City, Mamira. Now, uh, listen, I- I'll call you back later. Oh, uh, look, Miss... Uh, Mary Lee. Oh, uh, look, Mary Lee. I-, I guess you don't know what you got yourself into here. It's like this. This ship is carrying cala fever serum to the survey group on Woden. Yes. Their supply was wrecked in a tornado. The fever is always fatal unless the serum is given in the first 48 hours. Now, little ships like this one have exactly enough fuel to reach their destination. If you stay aboard her, your added weight will cause it to use up all its fuel before it can land. What happens then? We crash. You die, I die, and six fever victims on Woden die. Oh. Well, can't they send out another ship to meet it? There are no ships to send. Oh, well, I... Oh, no. Oh, no. You, you couldn't do that's that. That's how it has to be. Well, that's crazy. I haven't done anything. I haven't hurt anybody. I'm sorry. I, I should have told you before, but I, I wanted to make sure that there was no other way. You mean it? You're going to make me leave this ship? Well, that's ship? how it is. But I'll die. I... I'll explode. I'll be like those horrible pictures. I'll try to understand. I do understand. You're going to kill me. And I didn't do anything. I know you didn't. I know you didn't. That has nothing to do with it. Oh, that has everything to do with it. Nobody just dies like that for no reason. Listen, maybe there are other cruisers. Cruisers you don't know about. Maybe the radio. Maybe... Now listen to me. It's different here. Different from anything you've ever known. On Woden, there are 16 men. 16 men in an entire world. They're fighting. Fighting an alien environment. The environment fights back. You can only make a mistake once. And I made a mistake. Yes. There's no hope. Absolutely none. You have to be put out of this ship. <laughs> It was better so. With the loss of all hope would also go the fear. And then would come the resignation. She needed time and there was so little. Stardust to EDS. Need pertinent data. All right, Stardust. When do you expect to complete your report? I... I need a computer check. I'm intersecting course vector 7.3 at 0831. Deceleration 17.50, weight one ton. I would like to stay at point one zero as long as the computers allow. Check. I'll call you back. We wouldn't have long to wait. The new factors would be fed into the steel maw of the computer bank and the electrical impulses that go through the complex circuit. And here and there a relay would click, a tiny cog would turn over... But it would be the current, formless, mindless, invisible, which would determine with utter precision how long that pale young girl beside me would live. Five little fragments of metal in the second bank would trip against a neat ribbon, and the machine would spit out the answer. You will resume deceleration at 1910. It was 1810 when he spoke. One hour. She had one hour to live. One hour. That's it. All I did was hide in the closet. Now you tell me I have to die. I don't believe it. Well, you might as well get used to it. If this happened back on Earth, a thousand ships would fly the sky. The the whole world would know about it. They'd do everything to save me. Well, this isn't Earth. It's just a, a big dream. Jerry and I separated almost five years ago. We were too young. I was going to try to see him to try to make everything all right again. Are you married? I was. Oh? She ran off with some guy in the weather service. You still think about it? I don't let myself. Where is she? Back on Earth. 
Now, look, if you don't mind, I'd just as soon talk about something else. Okay. What do you do when you got an hour to live? What do you talk about? What's Jerry like? Jerry? Oh, he's a funny guy. When he found out, I, I mean about the other fella, he didn't get mad. He, he cried. That was all he felt. Sadness. So you walked all over him. Well, I, I thought I wanted him to get mad at me, to be jealous. And now? I've been thinking about him for five years. When I heard the ship was bound for Woden, well, I knew Jerry was there. I stowed away. I didn't know about the fuel. I didn't know this would happen to me. She had violated a man-made law that said keep out The penalty was not of man's making or desire Yet, it was not a penalty men could revoke Each amount of fuel will power an EDS with a mass of M safely to its destination the time was 18.30. Forty minutes left. It was beginning to get me. The space frontier is a rough place, and I've seen a hundred men die since I left Earth. But this was different. I watched her as she wrote a message to her folks. I watched her as she fought her way through the black horror of fear toward the calm and grave acceptance. And then, there it was on the view screen. The planet Woden. A red ball shrouded in the blue haze of its atmosphere, swimming in space against the background of the star-sprinkled blackness. The chronometer on the instrument panel said 1845. Oh, listen, we're in radio range of Woden now. Uh, would you want me to try and contact your husband? Jerry? Well, it would mean he would know you're going to die. Uh, there'd be nothing anyone can do. Yes. I'd like to talk to him. Do you think we can? Well, uh planet is turning. If his group is on the side facing us, we might be able to reach him. Please try. All right. Uh, hello? Hello, Woden. EDS to the government survey group. EDS to government survey group. Can you hear me? Come in, Woden. They may not be monitored. Hello? Hello, EDS. We read you. Hello? Hello? Uh, identify yourself, please. This is government survey group 105 on Woden. Roger, 105. This is John Barton, EDS pilot. Roger, we read you, Barton. You have the serum. That's affirmative on the serum. Uh, how bad is it down there? One man died last night. Six more have the fever. How long to touchdown? Over. I started deceleration at 1910 hours. I, I should be able to land at 1930. Thank God. Look, Woden, you have a Gerald Cross in charge of the group. Commander Cross? Yes, we do. Could I speak to him? He isn't here. He's out with the survey. When do you expect him? Sorry, EDS. We can't say for sure. How do you read me, Woden? Uh, how much time do we have left for communication? You're loud and clear, sir. We lose you in about 15 minutes. All right. Uh, if uh, Commander Cross comes back before we lose radio contact, will you have him buzz me? It's very important. Uh, Roger, EDS. I'll keep the channel open here. Ground station by. <laughs> The minutes passed like slow bits of eternity. On the view screen, I could see Manning's continent sprawled like a gigantic hourglass in the eastern sea. And there was a thin line of shadow where it was beginning to disappear as the planet turned on its axis. I looked at the pale woman next to me, and I thought of another woman long ago who had sat next to me, who had tried because I wouldn't understand. What had she written in those letters to her folks back home? What would they think of the faceless, unknown pilot who had sent her to her death? What would I think of myself, alone at night, reliving this voyage? Cold, isn't it? I'll turn up the thermostat. Nothing from Jerry? Now we have about two minutes of radio contact left. Maybe it's better. I mean, suppose it were you and your wife tried to call you. How would you feel? I don't know. Did you ever hear from her? Oh, I got a letter about a year ago. I tore it up. That was foolish. Yeah, it was. Life is so terribly short. Well, I... Uh, oh, no, wait a second. We're getting something. How much time before... before I have to leave the ship? Ten minutes. Hello. Hello, EDS. Come in. Come in. EDS? This is Woden 105. I have Commander Cross. All right. Uh, go ahead. This is Commander Cross. 
Jerry Cross? Yes. I have someone for you. Uh, uh, go ahead. Hello? Jerry? Hello? Jerry? Who is it? It's me, Mary Lee. Mary Lee? I wanted to see you again. I, I stowed away on the EDS. What? But Mary Lee... It doesn't matter, Jerry. All that matters is that I can tell you all the things I've kept inside for so long. Jerry, I want you to know I, I never forgot you. It's been so many years. I can't believe it. I thought I'd see you again, but now I can't. Jerry, you don't hate me, do you? Hate you? Oh, Mary Lee, I never stopped loving you. Not for an instant. Oh, Jerry. Listen, we don't have much time. The transmission is beginning to fade. Mary Lee, I've got to see you. There's got to be some way. There isn't. Let me talk to the pilot. Let me have it. H Hello? Pilot, when you called the mothership, did you have them check the computers? I've done everything. You've been on the frontier long enough to know the setup on an EDS. Oh, dear God, there must be something, some way. Do you think I'd let this happen if I wasn't sure? He tried to help me, Jerry. He tried. It really doesn't matter. I'm not frightened anymore. Not now. But how did you get here? I don't understand. I was going to Mamira to take a job, I thought. Now I realize I was just going to be closer to where you were. Oh, Jerry, all this time. Don't. Let me tell you something. Mary Lee, I've always known you'd come back to me. I've known it every minute. It's what's kept me alive. I want you to hold that in your mind. We haven't much time. We're losing radio contact. Jerry? Don't cry, darling. Just know how I feel. I do? It's fading. There's so many things to say. Jerry, you can still hear me. Maybe I'll come to see you again. Maybe I'll come to you in your dreams. I'll be the touch of a breeze. Or... Oh, one of those golden-winged little birds singing my silly head off. Or maybe I'll be nothing you can see or hear. But you'll know I'm there. Think of me like that, Jerry. Goodbye. Goodbye, my darling. I'll always love you. She sat motionless in the silence that followed, and then she looked at me. Now? Now. I pulled down the black lever, and the inner door of the lock slid open. She walked with her head up, the brown curls brushing her shoulders. I let her do it alone. She stepped into the lock and turned to face me. I could see the pulse in her throat. I'm ready. I pulled the red lever, and there was a slight waver as the air gushed out. I thought I sensed a bump as if something had bumped the outer door. And then there was nothing. And the white hand of the closet temperature control was back at zero. A cold equation had been balanced. And I was alone in the ship. WMUK Special Projects has presented Cold Equations, a story by Tom Godwin, adapted for radio by George Leppers. Featured in our cast were Mark Spink as Barton and Peg Small as the stowaway. With Richard Niesink as Commander Delhart, John Scott as Jerry, and Richard Atwell as the Woden Monitor. Future Tense is produced and directed by Ellie Siegel. Next, on Future Tense. Uh, here. Uh, wait till I adjust the set here. Now, there. You, you see this picture? Looks like a scotch plaid. Well, we finally assigned the colors so that they seem to give a rational picture. Now, wait a minute. I'll, I'll clear it up here. There. there. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. There, there it is. What is that? 
That's the signal from the stars. If you are enjoying these future tense programs and would like to hear more drama on WMUK, please let us know. Address your comments as well as suggestions for future programs to Future Tense, WMUK, Western Michigan University, Kalamazoo, Michigan. The zip code is 49001. This is Gerard McLeod inviting you and your entire family to join us every Monday through Thursday at this same time for Future Tense. Be sure to listen. WMUK, Kalamazoo. Located on... of the Chicago Police Department. There was a time when my busy teeming city was known as the crime center of the world. Happily, this is no longer so. One of the reasons for this change will be dramatized tonight. A report on a blonde tigress. In just a moment, I'll tell you more about the woman with the strange green eyes. Police of Chicago and the police of the western suburbs were bothered by a gang of three. Two men and a woman were starting an epidemic of holdups. Eleanor Jarman was tough and brutal, the leader of a gang ready for any kind of holdup, but specializing in small businesses. William Kennedy, a small time operator with a big mouth and muscles to match, was one of her partners. He usually worked close with her on their jobs. And the last of the ill assorted threesome was a pug by the name of Leo Minacci. This ex-prize fighter had absorbed too many punches. He was dangerous. On a hot afternoon in August, this trio stopped at a small store on West Division Street. Good morning. Good morning, Miss. I'm giving a party, and I wonder if you have some really good caviar. Caviar? Uh, table 90. Wait, I'll, I'll show you. Thank you. Just step this way. Here it is. I think this is an excellent... The shooting of the proprietor was brutally unnecessary and unprovoked, but that was the modus operandi of the blonde tigress. Mr. Hoey was a man of great courage. Dazed and mortally wounded, he still refused to give up. Help! Robbers! Police! Within minutes, the call came into precinct headquarters, where detectives Danny and Brinker were alerted. They wasted no time getting to the scene. A lot of people had a lot of ideas, adding up to a very general description of a blonde and two male gunmen. One woman said the blonde had eyes like a tigress. On the car, no one seemed to agree. The detectives thought they had lost this lead until Brinken felt a tug on his sleeve. Yes, son, what is it? I saw it, sir. Almost all of it. Good, I hope you can add something. It's just like they said. But that blonde woman, she's the tough one. And the, uh, the car, did you notice the car? Yes, sir. A new Nash, black. A sedan, four-door. Its license number was 8971635. Smart boy. Thank you, sir. Had a pencil, but no paper. 
I'm training myself. Training yourself? Yes, sir. I want to be a cop. That's an ambition I question at times. But, son, uh, Yes, sir? Don't say cop. We frown on that nickname. That scrawny, serious youngster who wanted to grow up to be a policeman gave us the first real lead. The license number brought us to the west side and someone named Pete Dodero. When you've been in this business as long as Denny and Brinkin, you don't get too optimistic. But somehow this lead felt good to them. I'm Detective Brinkin. This is Detective Denny. We're looking for Pete Dodero. I'm Pete Dodero. That's the license number of your car? Mm. Sure, that's it. Why? What's the matter? Where's the car now? I loaned it to a friend of my brother's. Your brother home? No. What about his friend? What do you say his name is? Leo Manessi. Is he here? No, no one's here. Where do you think we could find this Leo? Lives right here in the neighborhood. Say, what's this all about? Your uh, car was involved in an accident. Accident? Why, that dirty no good. He swore he'd be careful. Now maybe you'll tell us where he lives. I'll show you where. Uh, we can handle it. Just give us the address. All right. It's 829 Brock Road. A few blocks over. You can't miss it. Thanks. We'll see you get your car back. Tell that punchy bum for me. He better get it back. And in one piece. I haven't even got it paid for yet. Leo wasn't home, but his landlady gave us some important information about a blonde woman and a short, stocky man, naming Eleanor Jarman and William Kennedy. For good measure, she gave us the home address of one of Eleanor's boyfriends, Thomas Bittara. We're looking for Tom Bittara. Mr. Bittara just moved out. Well, we'd like to see his apartment. I can't let you into his apartment without his permission. He left a few things. We better warrant. But Mr. Batara is a gentleman. He's a gentleman. He won't mind. Now look, I... Oh, all right, but you're responsible. Luckily, Batara had not completed his move from the apartment. Giving the room a going over, the detectives found an interesting item. A packet of love letters. The letters were to suggest a plan to trip Batara. Oh, Kovac, it's good to be alive. It's good to see you. Yeah, it's a mean-looking gash in your leg, Gus. You better lie still. Oh, don't worry about me. Go help Mr. Rittenhouse or Alice. No, oh, he's all right. And Alice, a smart guy, you. Get shipwrecked with a Red Cross nurse. That's using your head. For my leg, it's... It's leaking, huh? Hey, I'm not going to be stuck with a gifty leg, am I? No, oh, not enough to interfere with your jitterbugging. John, huh? Yeah, you tell her, Kovacs. He's the champion hoofer of the Merchant Marine, Alice. Yeah, that ain't all. Tell her what I've done in Jersey City. Later. Let's go forward, Kovacs. Okay. Once it rolls, man, I caught two prizes in one Now, day. you rest. I'll be right back. Well, I'll be waiting. Oh, it's, it's a pretty right guy. Any other man will be crying mad with pain. Kovacs, there's no sulfonilamide in the kit. His wound's full of dirt and oil. What are we going to do? Only God knows. I tell you, Connie, I thought everybody was killed. I never expected to see you alive. <laughs> I'm practically immortal, darling. I've got nine lives, and I've only used up three or four. Well, I thought I was done for. We were playing poker in the saloon. Porter, you're the only person aboard with a blanket. I'd like it to cover, Gus. Take it. Don't ask. Look, chum, I'll do my own charity work if and when I want to. And right Here's now... Here's the blanket, Alice. Thanks. Well, share and share alike, I always say. That's right. Young man, who are you? Engine crew oil. The name's Kovac. Rittenhouse is my name. Yeah, I'm glad to... Rittenhouse. That's right. C.J. Rittenhouse, the richest man in America. So I have been led to believe. Rit. Yes? In the water. What's that crawling towards us? Hmm. Looks like we'll soon be having a couple more gifts. And don't say there is a room in this corner. I didn't say that. And You're besides... closest to the steering wheel. Start rowing. Well... That's a nice little... Do your own rowing. One row. Mr. Rittenhouse, you give me a hand. Oh, of course. Huh. Good morning to the left, Miss Porter. I don't need your advice. I rowed boats before you were born. Oh, dear, what am I saying? Enough, Miss Porter. Over here, Mr. Rittenhouse. Okie dokie. Hey, it's Joe. Joe, here, grab my arm. 
Cobra. Yeah. Never mind me. Get a hold of Miss Higgins and the baby. Okay. Here we go, Miss Higgins. Oh, birthday. Birthday. You're all right. Come on. Go. 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 Hello, Miss Porter. Hello. Won't you please take care of the baby? Miss Higgins, she kept fighting me all the time in the water. She wanted to drown the baby. Miss <laughs> Baby, my baby. What are you waiting for, Miss Porter? Oh, yes, of course, Miss Higgins, if you like. No, 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 no. My dear, really, it's quite all right. My, my hands are clean. No, somebody will touch my baby. No, darling, I assure you, I'm perfectly capable of handling a child. Although I admit I haven't had too much experience. You see, I never could spare the time. But don't let that worry you. There, you see? You see, it isn't even frightened of me. Not even a peep out of the deal. No, no, give it back to me. Mrs. Mrs. Higgins, it's all right. Now you just lie down here. We'll take care of you and your baby. Who are you? My name's Alice, and I'm a nurse. Oh, yes. Uh, Thank you. Uh, For heaven's sake, she's faint. I'll take care of her. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Rather depressing, is Here, nurse. Better cover her with my coat. That's very generous of you. Forget it. What are you staring at, Kovac? You. Aren't you going to be lonesome without the mink? Don't worry. There's plenty more where this one came from. I have four more just like it at home. If you ever get home. Of course I will. Now disappear, huh? You're waking the baby. Better give it to me. Why? The child is very comfortable right where she is. Miss Porter, let me have the baby. I should say not. Miss Porter, the baby's dead. Oh, dear God. <laughs> So ends the first act of our screen director's playhouse production of Lifeboat, starring Tallulah Bankhead and Jeff Chandler. Everywhere today, people who for years have sought a fast-acting way to relieve the pain of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia are turning to Anison. And it's interesting to know that these remarkable tablets work with incredible speed to relieve the pain of headaches, neuritis, or neuralgia. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is... Anison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients. In fact, thousands of people have been handed envelopes containing Anison tablets by their own physicians or dentists. If you have not already been introduced to Anison in this way, why not try Anison next time you suffer headache, neuritis, or neuralgia pain? On this generous basis, if the first few tablets do not bring all the relief you want as fast as you want it, Return the unused portion and your money will be refunded in full. Anison is spelled A-N-A-C-I-N. Easy to take Anison tablets come in handy boxes of 12 and 30 and economical family-sized bottles of 50 and 100. <laughs> back to the second act of the Screen Director's Playhouse production of Lifeboat, starring Tallulah Bankhead and Jeff Chandler. Back at my typewriter, I've begun a log of our adventure aboard this shabby and overcrowded lifeboat. This is our second day at sea. This morning we awakened and we discovered that Mrs. Higgins was no longer a member of our party. During the night she slipped overboard and joined her child. Another tragedy of this unholy war. But we gained another passenger shortly thereafter. Ironically, a Nazi seaman from the U-boat which sank our freighter. From the moment of his arrival, it has become my privilege, <laughs> did I say privilege, to serve as his interpreter, since I'm the only one who speaks German. As the men rig the makeshift sails, it is apparent that thunder in the form of friend Kovac is about to burst. Ich bin Ihnen sehr dankbar. Sie haben mein Leben gerettet. Es tut mir leid, dass wir Ihr Schiff versenken müssen. Yeah, what's he whining about? He merely is saying he's very grateful to us for saving his life and regrets very much the U boat was compelled to sink our ship. Ask him why they shelled our lifeboats. Madam, she's in sea of, uh, of Rettel's water. The failed is Captain those are his captain's orders. Ask him if he's a captain. Zinzi, the captain, there's you both. 
Nein, ich bin nur ein Mann der Besetzung. Kein Offizier. He denies he's a captain or officer. He's just a crew member. A crew member of Skipper. He's German. That's what I can't stomach. Well, a guy can't help being a German if he's born a German, can he? Neither can a rattlesnake help being a rattlesnake if he's born a rattlesnake. That don't make him a nightingale. Oh, Gus, isn't that a pair of new nylons on your hand? Oh, it's a fine time to discuss nylons. Please, Gus, who are they for? Huh? Well, they're a present for my girl Rosie in New York. Oh? Oh, you know, I've gone through earthquakes, pestilence, war and shipwreck with my head bloody and unbowed. But there's one thing I know I can't survive. With this run in my stocking. Oh, no. Darling, it does things for my morale. Throw the Nazi buzzard overboard. Don't be silly, darling. He can't very well get off in the middle of the ocean, can he? Throw him off. It's out of the question. It's against the law. Whose law, Mr. Rittenhouse? We're on our own here. We make our own laws. Now, wait. This man was acting under orders. Our freighter was an enemy ship. After all, we're at war. Was Mrs. Higgins at war? Was her baby at war? Sie sprechen sehr gut Deutsch. Uh, haben Sie Beziehung in Deutschland? Miss Dutch Weiss. What did he say? He says I speak his language well. <laughs> he asked whether I had any German connections. Had you? Certainly not. And how come you know the lingo so well? And how come when I climbed into this lifeboat that you were the only one in it? All dressed up like, like you knew you were going someplace. Because I was going someplace. I was going into a lifeboat. And you certainly didn't forget to bring plenty of luggage along. Luggage? <laughs> you silly, ridiculous ass. Like... What is this? Are you insinuating? You seem to be pretty anxious to stand up for your friend here. What do you mean, my friend? Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's keep our shirts on. I haven't got a shirt, Mr. Rittenhouse, or a mink coat either. Oh, I get it. A fellow traveler. I thought the common turn was dissolved. Now, children. Throw him overboard and then stick around and watch him drown. And when he goes down, I'll dance a jig like Hitler did when France went down. You're not alone here, Kovac. Let's leave the decision to the majority. That's the American way. Yes? Well... For the record, I'm an American, see, but I'm in kind of a spot because my name is Gus Schmidt, see, and I changed it to Smith. And that's what I got against these guys more than anything else because they made me ashamed of the name I was born with. And I say, chuck them to the sharks. Alice? I don't understand people hurting each other or killing each other. It seems to me he should be turned over to the proper authorities. So do I. I'll talk to the man. Perhaps I can get some information from him. Material for your book? Incidentally. What about you, Joe? Do I get to vote, too? Why, yes, certainly. Uh, I guess I'd rather stay out of this. That makes it three to two, the German states. Well, let's get down to business. Let's begin by unfurling the sail. Joe, you take that detail. Yes, sir. Kovac? One moment, Kovac. You know something about machinery, don't you? A little. Well, see if you can fix this clasp on my bracelet. Okay, give me a hand. Gently. Very gently. I don't even mind if I don't touch it. Miss Porter, I've read a lot of your stuff. Darling, how utterly charming. You want to know what's the matter with it? No, do tell me. You've been all over the world. You've met all kinds of people, but you never write about them. You only write about yourself. You think the whole war's a show put on for you to cover as a correspondent like a Broadway play. If enough people die before the last act, maybe you might give it four stars. All right, Tavares. Now you listen to me. Gangway, here comes the sail. Head down or head up. Uh, folks, we're underway. Well, where to? Huh? Where are we going? Bermuda. What about the course? Well, uh, anybody here know the course to Bermuda? Well, I was at the wheel when we got punctured, and the course was 315 east-southeast. Take the tiller, Kovac. East, southeast it is. Which way is east, southeast? Without a compass? Uh, what about the sun? With the sun this high, it's pretty hard to tell the points of a compass. I think it's out that way. You think? I'll tell you the rest in one moment. I'll ask the German. Können Sie an die Richtung aus Südost angeben? Den wie ich bitte sehr. He says east, southeast is in that direction. How does he know? He ought to know. I was under the impression his sub was operating around here, wasn't it? I suppose he'd lead us to Bermuda, British territory. Don't you suppose he'd rather be a prisoner of war in Bermuda than here? I don't trust him. Kovac, you're prejudiced and you can't think straight. If anybody's in a position to know where we are and where Bermuda is, he's the one. Who says so? We'll follow the Germans' course. Oh, well, like a juice skipper. Well, is there anybody else you'd rather have? What do you know about a ship? Well, among other things, he just happens to own a shipyard, that's all. Has he ever been in it? He has thousands of employees. He knows how to handle men. Not in a lifeboat. But we need an able seaman. How about you, Gus? Well, me, well... <laughs> nah. Now, right now, I'm kind of a disabled seaman with this leg. 
How about yourself, Kovacs? That trunk run this boat with what? An oil can? If you're talking about a skipper, we've got a skipper right on this boat, the German. But he wasn't the captain. <laughs> wasn't he? Herr Captain. Yeah? There you are, ladies and gentlemen. There's your skipper. What about it? You mean you want to turn your boat over to the man who sunk our freighter and shelled our lifeboats? I mean, I want you to turn over the boat to the man obviously best qualified to run it. Well, you're crazy. Well, why shouldn't you take charge, Kovac? Because I'm taking charge. Since when? As of now, I'm skipper. Anybody don't like it can get out and swim to Bermuda. What about that? I'll buy it. It's me. You too, Kovac. The good old American way, Mr. Rittenhouse. <laughs> Typewriter went with me everywhere. Paris, Berlin, Rome, Berlin. Now, Connie, quit grousing. You've been saying the same thing over and over for three days now. Why shouldn't I grouse? Little by little, I'm being stripped of all my earthly possessions. First, my camera. Well, I don't mind the loss of the camera so much. There's a film in it. I get ill when I think of it. Then my blanket goes. Then my fur coat. Mrs. Higgins could have had at least been considerate enough to return it to me before she jumped overboard. Say, Kovac, why did you get that memo pad in your hand? I borrowed it from you to make a deck of cards. You mean to say that you opened my bag? It was open. How about a little poker? Okie dokie. Did you win, Miss Porter? With the deck you made, darling? Jack's openers. That'll do for a starter. Dollar limit? Okie dokie. Got the deal. Your deal. Now, wait, I'll take off my jacket. Mm Mm-hmm. No shirt underneath, Rick. Look at all that pretty tattooing. What are those letters on your diaphragm, Kovac? Love letters. <laughs> so you believe in advertising? I open I never could fathom this quaint business of making a billboard out of one's torso. Oh, stay. Three cards. I must say, however, that you've shown commendable delicacy just tattooing the initial and not printing the names, addresses, and telephone numbers. Let's see now, how many are there? One, two, three, four... Five. Remind me to show you the rest of you sometime. Kovac. Yes, Alice? I've just removed the bandages from Gus's room. Better come on over to his corner with me. Yes, sure. I'll have a look, too. Boy, Michael, looks like a leg of lamb, doesn't it? Uh, for a Porter. Yabo? The spine must amputiert werden. What do you say, Miss Porter? Amputiert? Yeah? Yabo, unverzeichlich. The operation must sofort gemacht werden, or the man will sterben. What's the Nazi saying? Gus, I'm... I'm afraid your leg. Gangrene? Yeah, oh, gangrene. Gus, I mean, Alice, the leg would have to be amputated once. Oh, oh no, no, I... I've never even seen an amputation. Unter den gegebenen Umständen halten Sie es vielleicht für unangemessen, meine Dienste in Anspruch zu nehmen. Aber ich bin sure vom Beruf und habe viele Amputationen durchgeführt. He says he knows he's an enemy, and technically our prisoner, so perhaps we won't care to trust him with the operation, but he's willing to do it. He was a surgeon in civilian life. He's done many operations. Yeah, if he did, they were probably illegal. No dice. I don't want no operation. Darling, you want to live, don't you? Not with one leg. Oh, don't be a sad guy. You don't understand. Sure, I do, I. Rosie. What's Rosie got to do with it? Everything. If, if, if I lose my leg, I, I lose Rosie. If she was the right kind of woman, now, it would... Kovac, you take that back. Darling, don't pay any attention to that human 24 sheet. You listen to me. I may not know Rosie, but I know women. Some of my best friends are women. And one of them is that kind of a... What kind of a... A free soul. Yeah, that's Rosie. An independent spirit who lives her own life. Yeah, that's Rosie all over. With a heart that embraces all humanity. Her motto is to give. Hey, Rosie, give anybody the shirt off her back. She's got a heart that's as big as a head. And you want to break it. Who, oh, me? Oh, you'd rather die than trust her. Who says I don't trust her? It's Al Margulian I don't trust. He knew Rosie before I did, and she swore to me that there was nothing between them, and maybe there wasn't. But this Rosie, she's human just like anybody else. It ain't like we was married or we had a home and all, and I... Maybe we should have got hitched before I left on our last cruise, and I guess I should have took care of that insurance because Rosie kept asking me about it. Well, you see, the kid's always thinking of me. Well, that's why you've got to think of her. Back home, waiting for you, putting on a brave front, dancing, smiling, and apparently having a good time. But all the while, her heart's aching, torn with loneliness and uncertainty, not knowing whether you're dead or alive. 
And then at last to find out that you risked your life, perhaps died, just because you had no faith in her. Oh, God, would you be? Poor kid, she'd be brokenhearted when she... What are you all waiting for? Let's go. But how can the German perform the amputation without instruments? There's no anesthetic. Easy, Alice. Pull back to loan him his knife. So the anesthetic, the best we had to offer was my flask of brandy. It'll help kill the pain. Oh, yummy boy, do I feel pretty good here, Kovac. Yeah, Gus. <laughs> what would you want to say that about Rosie? I'm sorry, kid. Well, you take it back. Okay, okay, I take it back. How do you feel, Gus? I'll never forget you, Miss Porter. <laughs> You're fine, so you bitte. Alice, we'll go with the doctor. Take my lighter to sterilize the, the instrument. Yes. Hi, nice. <laughs> Hi, Gus. Well, anyway, it's an experience... Sure, sure. Hey, Kovac, when Rosie and I get hitched, I want you to be my best man. Glad to. Yeah, your pal, you're the best pal I have in the world. All right, come on, have a, have a drink on me. Yeah, sure. <sighs> Guess I ought to have my head examined. I, I didn't have to go to sea. I could have got a job in a defense plant making good jacks. Or I could have joined the army, even the navy, and Dennis, I'd have had a stay in that stinking old rust building. I don't miss him, Stoyer, Stane. We want somebody at the tiller. Take him, Mr. Rittenhouse. Okie dokie. In this corner. Call me Connie. Hi, babe. Hi, t- Just a kiss, eh? Huh? Huh. What are we waiting for, pal? <laughs> Here's to you, Connie. Last drop in a bottle. Bottoms up. Bottoms up. Hey, Joe, what'd you stop playing for? Give us a little music. Yeah. Okay, Gus. <laughs> None of that slicker music. Yeah, come on, boogie it up. Let's have a jam session. Yes, sir. Call him Porter. Yabo? Kuss auf die Wärme. Das Boot muss so ruhig gehalten werden wie möglich. Come back. We want the boat held steady as possible. Head her into the sea, Mr. Rittenhouse. Here, Doctor. Hello. Well, chums, is there anyone here who knows how to pray? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. third act of the screen director's playhouse presentation of Lifeboat continues in just a minute. But now, here's a word from RCA Victor. How do you like your dramas? Comic? Tragic? Mysteries? Romantic? Old or new? It doesn't matter. You get them all on television today. How do you like your opera? Grand? Comic? Soap? Or horse? Oh, it doesn't matter. You get them all on television today. Yes, from ball games to ballroom dancing, from stamp clubs to nightclubs, the whole world of entertainment will be yours to watch once you buy the television set you're longing for. If you're a typical American, you'll want that set to be an RCA Victor. Already, more than a million American families have bought RCA Victor television. It's literally million-proof, proven in over a million homes. 
the 18 beautiful new RCA Victor million-proof models leave you with no excuse to wait. Embark immediately on the television way of life, the RCA Victor way. Don't you be left stranded on the shore. See your RCA Victor dealer tomorrow. <laughs> Listening to the Screen Director's Playhouse, one of five great radio shows that are brought to you five nights a week by the Whitehall Pharmacal Company, makers of Anison, Colinos, Bicidol, and other fine drug products, and RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. The Screen Director's Playhouse presentation of Lifeboat, starring Tallulah Bankhead and Jeff Chandler, will continue after a short pause for station identification. Stay tuned to your local station on NBC. for the third act of the screen director's production of Lifeboat, starring Tallulah Bankhead as Connie and Jeff Chandler as Kovac. Another day has passed. I don't like keeping a log in long hand. It's difficult enough to transcribe my typing, but my handwriting reads like some sort of bangy mumbo-jumbo. Oh, well, I can always hire a code expert to decipher it for me. Here goes. An amazing transformation came over the German from the moment Kovac's knife served as a scaffold. It was the face of a surgeon, of a man who'd forgotten his Nazi oath to Hitler and remembered another unspoken oath to Hippocrates. The thing that got me was his coolness. Despite the rotten boat and the waves that tauntingly and challengingly pounded our sides, you'd have thought he was operating in a hospital with all the necessary tools and equipment. And yet, Gus had not come to. In this stupor, he is struggling violently. There's a bitter touch of irony before my eyes. At Gus's side are two shoes. The tension aboard has not lessened. Still think we're on the right course? Let's play poker, huh? But that's important, man. Uh, Connie. Yes, Ray? Ask our German friend if he still thinks we're not on the right course. Herr Kapitän. Yeah. Glauben Sie immer noch, dass wir nicht an Russen tagen? Kuss auf Bermuda? Rostornen? Ohne Kompass ist das wirklich schwer zu sagen. He says he can't be sure without a compass. Pretty certain a few hours ago. Well, we've probably drifted somewhat on account of the current. Oh, we've been all through that. What's the German doing in this part of the boat anyway? Why? Is he in quarantine? Tell him to get back to the bow where he belongs. I'll do nothing of the sort. There's no need for you to treat the man like a leper. He did save Gus's life, you know. As for our being on the proper course, it's imperative that we get Gus to a hospital as soon as possible. You're aware of that? I am. Then why not listen to somebody who knows? Herr Kapitän, haben wir oder haben wir nicht Kuss auf Bermuda? Bitte, gnädige Frau. Uh... Antworten Sie. Your order, nein? Nein. No. He admits we're on the wrong course. He admits. He's only saying what he said before. You know, of course, Kovac, there's a chance he's right. That's my funeral. No, it isn't. It's Gus's funeral. Hey, wait, wait a minute. What is this? Gus. Well, fella, how do you feel? Gus. Well, I'm in the pink. I'm sight of a little hangover. Right now, I give the other leg for a cigarette. Here you are, darling. And the light that goes with it. Hey, here's the doc. Hey, doc is shown. You're going to be okay, Gus. Yeah, sure, sure. Hey, Kovac, how soon will we get to Bermuda? Pretty soon. Oh, that'll be great. Gus, uh, there's still a little difference of opinion about the direction we're headed. 
I don't trust the Nazi. There must be other submarines around. He knows where they are. Or maybe a supply ship. He knows where that is, too. On general principle, I'd copper anything he says. You agree with me, Joe? Alice? Doesn't anybody agree with me? You're the skipper, Kovac. I'm in the minority. We follow the Germans, of course. Lovely night to get seasick, isn't it, Kovac? That's what you said. I don't like the wind in these waves. What can we do about it? Check with the German. He's your seeing eye dog. The man's entitled to sleep once in a while, you know. I don't even trust him when he's sleeping, Rick. Can I ask you something personal? I've been married twice. No, I don't care about that. You went to school, didn't you? Yes, darling. It was in kindergarten when I first fell in love. Do you know anything about astronomy? Darling, who had the time? Alice. Yes? Do you know anything about the stars? A little. I can tell you that that's Mars to the right and Venus to the left. And that's Big Dippy and Little Dippy. Gus. Gus, what direction is Venus? East. That's the Germans' course. We're heading to Miss Bermuda. Yeah, you're right. Now you know why I changed my name to Smith. That doesn't prove a thing. Miss Porter. Yes, Alice? Remember after the operation, you looked at your wristwatch and, and told the German the time? Did he ask you the time? Of course he did. It's funny. He had a watch of his own. Yeah. yeah. If he had a watch of his own, why did he ask for the time? Perhaps he had some sort of phobia or something. Yes, but he looked at his own watch right before that. Then he took a squint at the sun. Oh, that's very interesting. The sun plus a... Miss Porter, what time was it? Ten after seven. I think you're slow. Slow? This is a Philip Patrick. I want to know what time it is by the Germans' watch. Brisk him for his biscuit, Joe. Aye, aye, sir. Just what is a biscuit, Kovac? A ticker, a watch. Joe used to be one of the best all-around yeggs in the business. What are you doing opening that night? I'm working myself into a mood. Here comes Joe. Got it, Kovac. All right, give it to Miss Porter. I'm not interested. Well, take it and check it with your time. This is ridiculous. Ridiculous, huh? What time is it on the German's watch? It... It isn't a watch. It's... It's a compass. Wait, Kovac. What are you going to do? What do you think we're going to do? Don't say we. You'll never get me to consent to anything like that. I'm not consulting you, Reed. I'm not consulting anybody. But Kovac, it's murder. Please listen to me. We can't. We must Why not, Alice? Execution isn't murder. Then let him have it, Kovac. No, why can't we tie him up? Keep a watch on him. What are you so squeamish about? We're at war, aren't we? You've been there. You've seen him killed, haven't you? In battle, yes, but not in cold blood like this. Look out! Away! We're in for it. Here comes another. Guys, give me a hand of the life into the man. Help yourself, Cobra. Don't go for it. <laughs> uh, how'd I do, Willie? Fine, Ed. Fine. Uh, for the accompanist. 
<laughs> Mr. Rich, you didn't make a single mistake, either. <laughs> Rich, you're a born accompanist. We're all born accompanists. How'd I do, Willie? <laughs> what, Happy? Call back, you silly goon. What are you laughing about? Oh, that's one for the book. Our enemy, our prisoner of war. Now we're his prisoners. He's the lighter of the boat. Singing German lullabies to us while he roses to a supply ship in a concentration camp. Tell him, Willie. Tell him how funny that is. Oh, it's not funny. It's logical. In the storm, we're blowing quite a bit off of our course. Without a sail, it would take us weeks to get to Bermuda. You'll never make it. Without food and water, how long do you think you can keep on rowing like this? Long enough, Mr. Kovac, to reach my objective. How can you keep rowing, Willie, hour after hour, when the rest of us can hardly lift an oar? Oh, that's easy. It's the master race, the heron folk. Don't you know they can do anything? I'm beginning to believe it. Tell me, Willie, why didn't you speak English when you first got on the boat? Well, you see, <clears throat> I didn't know then whether I could trust you or not. Don't be so sharp, Miss Porter. Wie geht's, uh, Schmidt? Schmidt is the name. All right, Mr. Smith. How do you feel today? <clears throat> the same as yesterday and a day before and a day before. I'm thirsty. I hope. Look above you. See that cloud? It's a rain cloud. If it bursts, you drink. If it don't? I'm sorry. I cannot dictate to the heavens. Hey, I gotta have a drink. I gotta have water. No, guys. You mustn't not from the ocean. The thought would only make you thirstier. Well, look, just a little sip. You might just as well sip poison. It'll kill you. Um, uh, you know something? I think I'll take Rosie to the ball game today. <laughs> Gee, Rosie, baby, you're oh, gosh, I'm full of honey. It's what you are, Rosie. I'm There's nothing we can do to help you. Right? Not Come on, let's go you forward. All right. Down to let's sit down here and try to forget yeah, it. Sure. Anything to pass it, eh? Hey, Red. Red, how about some poker? Leave him to his food, brother. Say, that M.V. tattooed on your chest. Her initials are bigger than the others. You see the last? Now the first. What was her name? So you won't talk to me, huh? Where'd you get the diamond bracelet, Miss Porter? You may call me Connie. You did once during the storm, remember? You said, all right, Connie, we might as well go down together. I liked the way you said Connie. It was like a punch in the jaw. Tell me about the bracelet. That's a dead giveaway. You're wanting us to die together like that. Dying together is even more personal than living together. What'd you pay for the bracelet? Nothing. Barter? You're a low person, darling. Obviously out of the gutter. Maybe that's why I'm attracted to you. And maybe that's why you're attracted to me. All right, quit slumming. Funny part of it is, I'm from the same gutter. Are you kidding? Remember when you first got on the boat, you said you used to work in the packing house section of Chicago? Well, I came from there, too. Southside? Yeah. And I lived there until I got this bracelet, and it worked miracles for me. It took me from the south side to the north side. Hey, what are you doing with your lipstick? Placing my initials on your chest. Well, get it off and quit slumming. What about a few hands, Rick? You do Cover. My bracelet cloth's come loose again. Fix it. What's your stakes, Rick? He likes me, but he hates the bracelet. I wouldn't take it off for anything or anybody in the world. That Willie. I know where he gets the strength to roll. How many cards go with? Just one. How many days since the storm? It must be five since we've eaten and had a sip of water. Ever eat at Young's Hotel in Cleveland? Oh, I once ate at Antoine's in New Orleans. Doesn't compare with Young's Hotel. We used to have a menu of 150 pages. Well, oh, Connie. I'm taking two cards, Kovac. What's your bet? Twenty. I'll see you. Three nines. Straight. He never stops winning. Connie, did you ever eat at Young's Hotel? Finest seafood in the world. Rich, shut up! Oh, what's wrong? Stop jabbering about food. Isn't it enough that you lost all of us flies through your carelessness? 
callousness. Yes, stupid criminal callousness. It wasn't me. I wasn't in charge of the food. Joe took care of that. Why, you dirty rat. You lost it in the storm, and now you're trying to shift the blame on Joe. Connie, what's the matter with you? Oh, she's all right. Just a little hungry. What are you squawking about, Miss Porter? When you write your book, it'll make a swell chapter. Hmm. How it feels to be starving. First person singular. Well, those are good things to write about. Hunger and thirst. If you really come from the back of the yards. Hey! Keep your hands in your pockets. Easy, Connie. Control yourself. Out of my way. Kovac, why don't you kill Willie? Why don't you take your knife and just said you wouldn't cut his throat? I'll tell you why. You're not strong enough. He's made of iron and the rest of us are flesh and blood. Hungry flesh and blood. And thirsty. <laughs> Red, how much money are you worth? <sighs> enough to buy and sell you millions of times. What about raising the end? Anything you say. From now on, each match is a hundred dollars. Anything you say. All right, deal. How many factories you own? What business is that of yours? I was just thinking. By the time we get home, I might own one of them. I'll open for a hundred. Raise your hundred. See you. I'll take three. And I, I think I'll go for one of your airplane plants. I'll have a labor management committee, and the first thing we'll do Are is. Are you trying to tell me how to run my factories? No, not all of them. Just the one I'm going to run. Bet a hundred. Save. Queens. I got kings. It's funny the way you keep winning all the hands. I'm a lucky guy. Just the same, I wish we had a new deck. Another stack of matches. Here. Sorry, Kovac. Want to cut in? I have no money. It's all right. Bracelet. No, thanks. How much do I owe you, Kovac? Uh, Fourteen grand. Let's raise the ante. Thousand a match. It's your funeral. Deal him. Bet three grand. Let's see. How many cards? Two. <laughs> Someday you'll learn a do pay to hold a kicker. If you live long enough. Here's yours. I want three. Well, I guess I'll keep the pikers out. Bet five. Ah, matched your kicker, huh? Raise your front. Now you're talking my language. I'll up your ten. I'll see your ten and raise you one. Kovac, this is the moment I've been waiting for. I've got you over a barrel. I'm raising you all the chips you've got and all the money I owe you. Kovac, I think you've stepped out of your class this time. I'll call you, Rit. I got an ace full house. It's raining! It's raining! Uh, yeah. It's I'm, raining! I'm going to get the tarpaulin. Oh, it's Here it is, Kovac. Yeah. Give us a hand, will you, Rit? Grab a call. Hey, you too, Miss Porter. It's raining. Huh. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! The rain. The rain. Stop. It's stop. Oh, no. I have four fours, go back. So you win. Let me see him. See him? Where are they? What are my cards? <laughs> you threw them overboard in the excitement. I had four fours. How do I know? You ought to know. You made the cards, didn't you? And you marked them, too. They're quicker than you. I don't buy that kind of talk, Rich. Gently, boys, gently. What's this argument all about? Money? Go on, Rich. Write a check for a million. It'll cost you nothing. We are going nowhere slowly but definitely. <laughs> The wheel when she hits you, she goes, Rosie. Hey, Rosie, I want to dance. I want to dance all night. You go to sleep first. Go to sleep, Connie. Uh, sleep? What for? Everybody's sleeping. Uh, Willie ain't. He's growing. You know something? There's somebody has water on this boat. Willie. Sure, sure. Now go to sleep, yeah, Connie. Yeah, yeah. Good night, Rosie. Good night. Willie. Willie's got water, I saw him drinking water. Willie's got water, I saw him drinking. Willie, I'm coming over for a drink. Go back to sleep. 
Mm. You've been holding out on us. Shh. You must pick up the others. They're tired. Yeah, I feel fine. Except my right foot's asleep. I can hardly feel it. It's... <laughs> Tell me, Willie, should, should I ought to write to Rosie first and tell her about it? But, but or should I wait until I see her? Wait till you see her. Well, give me a lift up and so I can sit in here. There's something I gotta tell you. Of course. Here, give me your hand. I'll never forget what she done for me, Willie. If there's anything I can ever do for you, just speak up. Yes. You can remember your name is Schmidt. You like that better than Smith? Much better. Better hurry, Gus. Rosie's waiting. Yeah, but hey, the water you was drinking... Uh, Rosie's waiting for you. Well, why didn't you share that with the rest of us? Gus, shh, don't wake them up. Yeah. Okay, Willie. Why, why don't you go off to Roseland? There. Don't you see the lights? Well, hey, why are you pushing me over, boy? Hey! Help, Willie. You mustn't wake the others. But I can't swoop. Do, 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 What's going on? Where's Gus? Schmidt went over the side, Cormac. I didn't dream it. He was calling my name. Yes. You can't imagine how painful it was to me all night long to watch him. Turning about, suffering, and nothing I could do for him. Well, why didn't you stop Rowan? Why didn't you help him? I had no right to stop him, even if I wanted to. A poor cripple, dying of hunger and thirst. What good would life be to a man like that? Gus was trying to tell me something about water before. He was in agony from thirst. I wanted to cry, but the tears wouldn't come. Yes, how could they? If I remember rightly, tears are water with a trace of sodium chloride. Isn't that so, Willie? Yeah. And the chemical composition of sweat is water with a trace of something or other. Why are you sweating, Willie? Why? Because he's got some water and I'm going to get it. Right so, my friends. Here it is. The flask and the brandy. Give it to me. No, you can't take it from me. Get that. Oh, you fucking it, Kovac. Now there's no water. Where did you get that water, Willie? I took the precaution of filling the flask from the water breaker before the storm. And I had food tablets and energy pills, too, from the U-boat. You should be grateful I had the foresight to think of such things. To survive, one must have a plan. You're right, Willie. One must have a plan. Uh, there's nothing to worry about. Soon we'll reach the supply ship... And then we'll have food and water. Get him, Kovac. You know, good Nazi. Get him. Throw him over. Kill him. Kill him. Cut him with your knife, Kovac. Slice him piece by piece. Keep that overboard to the shark. Not yet, Kovac. That's something I've got to do. Give me room. Let me get to him. Look, Willie. Look. God is you. Remember the leg you cut off. Drop him, Kovac. Drop him. Go in and catch him, Willie. Here's got his shoot. I hold you at the bottom of the sea. Dying day. I'll never understand Willie and what he did. What do you do with people like that? Maybe somebody ought to try to row. Where to? What for? When we killed the German, we killed our motor. No, sir, Mr. Rip. We still got a motor. Who, Joe? God. Nah. We're through. That's what I think. I'm not afraid. Hold on, everybody. So we're all going to fold up and die just because the Ezard Superman is gone. My only regret, Connie, is that in the end, I joined a mob. Baloney, Rick. We weren't a mob when we killed him. We were a mob when we sat around kowtowing to him, obeying him, practically hiding him. 
because he was kind enough and strong enough to take us to a concentration camp. Rittenhouse. C.J. Rittenhouse. Self-made man. Made of what? As long as you're sitting there thinking of your last will and testament, I'll write your epitaph for you. Rit. Rit. The man who quit. And that goes for you too, Narcissus. There's room on your chest for another letter. Q for quitter. And you, Joe. It's all right for you to look up and trust in somebody. But how about giving him a hand? What's the matter with us? We not only let the Nazi do our rowing for us, but our thinking. Ye gods and little fishes. Fishes. Ye gods. We haven't got energy pills, but the sea's full of them. Millions of fish swimming around. Why don't we catch some? We tried to. We have no bait. Sure we have. My diamond bracelet. Bait by Cartier. Are you kidding? Kidding. My foot curl back. I'm starving. Well, what are you standing around for? Where's the fish line? Here. Bait your line, chum. All right. Yeah. Not only food, but oil. We can squeeze the fish for oil. It's better than water. I can recommend the bait. I should know. I bit on it myself. I've never eaten raw fish before. I better not count our chickens before then. Uh, what do you mean, chickens? Uh, line's baited. Uh, All right. Uh, Over uh, the side she goes. I'll uh, be the fisherman. Uh, oh, show me the poor fish that won't bite on that break. Now, everyone uh, be quiet. Let me concentrate. What's the matter, Kovac? Are you afraid the big fish will hear us? It wouldn't have been a bad idea to have used you for bait. You'd have scared the fish right out of the water. Is that so? Quiet, quiet. quiet. I got a bite. Yes, there's a pull on the line. It's a big fish. Kovac, look. A ship. There's a ship. Don't let go of that line. Don't let go. Gangway. Kovac, you let go of the line. My precious. My precious. Go to the bottom of the sea. Why are you? <laughs> she's heading right in our direction. She's only a few minutes away. It's a supply ship, all right. Yeah, yeah she's flying the good old Nazi double cross. Willie's got the last word at that. Yeah, they're low on a boat. Well... Some of my best friends are in concentration camps. I suppose the ship will have any coffee, real coffee. Hey, the what did he say, Connie? He said, yes, they got coffee and Wiener schnitzel and pig's knuckles and sauerkraut. Hey, hey well, what's going on? The supply ship's signaling to their boat. They're turning around. Why? Maybe they forgot the cream for the coffee. They're not going to pick us up. What's that? They've got to pick us up. They can't leave us here like this. Why, it's a violation of international law. What are you going to do, Kovac? So. Oh, right smack in the middle. It's one of our ships giving it to them. Give it to them, Navy. Give it to them, darling. Right. Give it to them. Here we go again. The supply ship's trying to make a run for us. Yes, and they're headed right for us. What are we going to do? Row, sister, row. Come on, out of my way. Come on. Out. Just step on the hook. Left. Are you kidding? Of course not. One of my best friends is in the Navy. Hey, you're really something. Don't forget, Kovac, you owe me a diamond bracelet. Yes, ma'am. And a typewriter. Sure. And a camera. You bet. And Kovac, behind you. What? What's behind you? The visitor clings to the side of the boat. What are you waiting for? Help him. Okay, chum. Here's a hand. Holy cow. A Nazi. Don't go on Oh, no. This is the last straw. You already forgot about Willie? That's a shame. Dr. Shane. That's exactly how it began before him. Kovac, not... Kovac, this is different. The lad wounded. Throw him back, Kovac. But he's utterly helpless. He's only a baby. All right, don't look now, but the baby has a revolver in his hand. It's aimed right at your heart. You see, you can't treat them like human beings. You've got to exterminate them or else. Dr. Shane. Get him, Kovac. Get him. Takes care of the Harold boy's gun. That Achtung business sure worked. Psychology, darling. It always works. Achtung in German means attention. A German is a robot who always heeds a superior's command. All right, get up to your feet, you dirty little... Don't go back. We'll turn him over to the neighbor. Sit down, sailor. Werden Sie mich nicht umbringen? What's he bleating about? He's asking, aren't you going to kill me? Poor devil. Aren't you going to kill me? What are you going to do with people like this? What do you suggest? I don't know. I was thinking of Mrs. Higgins and her baby and Gus. Maybe they could answer that. Yes, maybe they could.
And so ends our screen director's playhouse presentation of Lifeboat, with splendid performances by Tallulah Bankhead and Jeff Chandler. Next week, the screen director's playhouse is proud to present one of Hollywood's most delightful couples as we recreate another favorite motion picture. Our story is the heartwarming Mrs. Mike, directed by Lewis King. And in the starring roles, you'll hear Dick Powell and June Allison. <laughs> For exciting screen entertainment, see Daryl F. Zanuck's All About Eve, starring Betty Davis and Ann Baxter. It's another hit from 20th Century Fox. Listen every Sunday to your local NBC station for Tallulah Bankhead as mistress of ceremonies at the big show. Jeff Chandler can now be seen in Deporter, the Universal International Picture co-starring Marta Torres. Included in tonight's cast are Wilms Herbert, Ann Diamond, Henry Rowland, Barbara Eiler, Sheldon Leonard, and Roy Glenn. Lifeboat from an original screen story by John Steinbeck was adapted for radio by Jack Rubin. The Screen Director's Playhouse is produced under the supervision of Howard Wiley and is directed by Bill Carr. This is James Wallington speaking and inviting you to listen again next Thursday night when we present Screen Director's Playhouse, stars June Allison, Dick Powell, production Mrs. Mike, director Louis King. Listen again next week to Screen Director's Playhouse, the Thursday night feature on NBC's five-show festival of comedy, music, mystery, and drama. Listen tomorrow evening to the one and only Duffy Tavern, the Friday night feature of the five-show festival. Duffy's Tavern is open for business tomorrow night on NBC. Now, the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the series of radio dramas dedicated to the supernatural, the unusual, and the unknown. Come with me, my friends. We shall descend to the world of the unknown and forbidden. Down to the depths with a veil of time is lifted, and the supernatural reigns as king. Come with me and listen to the tale of the Shadow People. Elaine, have you been... I mean, have you seen anything else since you spoke to me last? No, I haven't. Ever since Mother died, nothing's happened. Well, I only hope that... <laughs> it came from upstairs. Come on. <laughs> I don't know what to think. I only hope it. Oh, Damn it, if anything's happened to him. I'm... We'll see in a moment. There's no light in this room. You wait here, Elaine. Where's the light? Over to your left. David. What's wrong? Why didn't you leave the light on? Your father's dead, Elaine. In just a moment, the Hall of Fantasy will present The Shadow People. And now for our story, an original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled The Shadow People. Somewhere along the line of your life, you've met them. You have come in contact with The Shadow People. When did we first discuss it? Oh, yes, Brian and Elaine and I. It was in my apartment. There was only one light on in the entire place. Oh! What's wrong? Oh! Elaine, what's the matter? Oh, it's, it's silly, I know, but I, I, I thought I saw something in that doorway over there. Where? Over there, right over there. Where are you going, David? Over to that archway, just to let you know that nothing's here. Huh. You see, Elaine, nothing's wrong, nothing at all. Are you satisfied that there's no one else here but us? Yes, I... Oh, I'm sorry. I just thought that I... Leave the overhead lights on. I'm sorry. I thought that... Put them back on, David, please. All right, Elaine. Look, what's bothering you, sis? I don't know. It's just that... Oh, I don't know. 
Tell us about it, Elaine. Tell us what's bothering you. You promise that you... You won't laugh at me? Of course not. Brian? Oh, Elaine, I'm your brother. If something's troubling you, uh, I'd like to know about it. All right, then. The reason I was so upset was the fact that I saw someone or something standing in that archway. But Elaine, David showed you that there was no one else in here. When the lights were put on, you saw for yourself that we were alone. I'm not talking about something you... You can see in the light, Brian. I'm not talking about a human being. And what's it all about, Elaine? In the darkness, I... I saw something that can't be seen in a lighted area. And I've seen it several times before. You sure you're not imagining this, Elaine? Oh, I don't have that good an imagination, Brian. How long have you... Have you seen this thing, Elaine? Well, it... It started about six weeks ago. You were in Detroit on business, Brian. Mom and Dad were on vacation... I was in the house by myself, in the library. There was only one light on. I sat in the chair beneath it, reading. Several times I thought that something was watching me. I felt there was someone in the room with me, standing right in back of me. Every so often I'd glance back over my shoulder, but there seemed to be nothing there. And then... Then I thought I heard someone whispering. I wasn't sure, but when I heard it again, I got up and I, I, I looked all over the house. Oh, I'm not easily frightened, you know that, but, but out in the hallway, it was almost entirely black. Luckily, I was near a light switch. I looked back over my shoulder and, and I saw this huge, hulking shape for the first time. And I heard a voice. Or rather, the whisper of a voice. I couldn't distinguish the words, but that dark shape seemed to be moving towards me. My hand was on the light switch, and I turned it on. In a minute, the light flooded the hallway. The shape was gone. There was nothing there. I was alone again. As long as there's light, I know it can't hurt me. I know it can't reach me. You might have imagined it, you know. Of course, that's possible, but I'm sure I didn't. It was so real. So real, that shape in the darkness. It was the very essence of evil itself. There was an old man I knew of, a Dr. Hesedius. I'd heard that he knew quite a good deal about the supposed supernatural manifestations which had taken place in the world. I went to him to see if he knew anything that might explain the events of the story Elaine had told us. Yes, my good sir. What do you wish? I have an appointment with Dr. Hesedius. Oh, yes, yes. He mentioned something about it. You are Mr. Drake. Yes. If you'll come inside. Thank you. Dr. Hesedius is in the study. Please come with me. Doctor, a visitor for you. Oh, yes. Bring him in. You may go now. Yes, Doctor. Mr. Drake? Yes. Sit down, please, in that chair over there. Thank you, sir. Now, what is the nature of your visit to me? Well, I understand, Dr. Vesedius, that you have a great knowledge of the supernatural manifestations which have occurred on the earth. Great knowledge, Mr. Drake? No, hardly that. I have only scratched the surface in my years of study. Perhaps I can help you. Then again, perhaps I cannot. Well, may I tell you the story? By all means, my good sir. All right. Now, this didn't happen to me, Doctor, but to my fiancée. It seems that about six weeks ago, when she was alone... But when the light was on, the dark form disappeared. And that's the story, sir. As much of it as I can remember. Mm -hmm. I see. It's a strange tale to tell. I'm fully aware of that, Dr. Vesilius. You say she seemed to hear whispered voices? Yes, that's what she says. I see. A moment, please. I have a book in my file. Oh, yes. Here it is. This is the one. Yes. Perhaps I may be able to help you after all. Let me see This is a very ancient book, Mr. Drake. I seem to remember... Yes. 
Here is an account of a happening such as you relate. And we shall live on the earth, and they shall not see us. Yes, it has been foretold by the ruler of the darkness. They who live by day and retire to sleep by night shall never know that we walk with them, that we watch them, that we wait for our chance. Only in the night will they see us, for in the daylight we are not seen. Only in the night, when the darkness grows together and the forms of the shadow people are shaped from the blackness, they will know us. Then they will know that we are their companions, for we are the shadow people. I knew I had read something similar to the story you have told me, Mr. Drake. Dr. Asilius, what can we do? Well, give me a little time. Let me see if I can find any more references to these uh, people of the darkness. One more thing, Mr. Drake. Yes. Be sure that your fiancé is never left alone at night. Be sure that there is some living thing, animal or human, which accompanies her every second of the night. For she is in danger, Mr. Drake. A terrible danger. Back now to our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled The Shadow People. That night, the night of the day I had seen Celius, Elaine's mother died. She died in her sleep. When she failed to appear for breakfast, Elaine's father went upstairs to see what was wrong. When he entered her room, he discovered that she was dead. The family doctor couldn't explain it, for Elaine's mother had been in perfect health. A few weeks later, I was out of the house spending a weekend with them. I glanced at the clock on the mantel, and it showed eleven. I can't understand why Brian hasn't returned from town. Well, he said he had some extra work to catch up on. He told me this morning that he might be late. Well, eleven o'clock, I'm going upstairs. Glad you came out, David. It's good seeing you again. It's a pleasure to be here, sir. Well, don't stay up too late. See you both in the morning. All right. Good night, Dad. Good night, Mr. Davis. He isn't the same, David. Ever since Mother died, he hasn't been the same. I didn't realize that until tonight. It's changed. I only hope that he'll start living again. Ever since she died, it, it seems that a part of him died with her. Elaine, have you been... I mean, have you seen anything else since you spoke to me last? No, I haven't. Ever since Mother died, nothing's happened. Well, I only hope... What's that? Came from upstairs. Come on. Oh. You don't think I don't know what to think. I only hope that... David, David if anything's happened to him... We'll see you in a moment. There's no light in this room. You wait here, Elaine. Where's the light? Over to your left. David, what's wrong? Why didn't you leave the light on? Your father's dead, Elaine. I had walked into the darkened bedroom. On the bed was Elaine's father. It didn't take a second look for me to know that he was dead. I switched off the light and walked back into the hallway to tell Elaine what happened. And then from the room there had come an eerie, quiet laughter. In the darkness of that room was some unknown evil power. The voice itself was unearthly. There was no substance to it. It sounded as if... As if it came from the darkness itself. No. No, I don't believe you. It's the truth, Elaine. There's nothing more I can do. We'll have to notify the police. Tell me it's not the truth, David. Tell me it's not true. I'm sorry, Elaine. I wish I could. Your father's dead. After the burial, Dr. Hesselius got in touch with me. He said that he wanted to meet both Elaine and Brian. That he wanted to talk to the three of us. Accordingly, a few nights later, he came out to their house. Stavis, will you tell me just when you saw the first manifestation? The night Brian was in Detroit. 
No, Miss Davis, you have even seen this apparition in the company of other people, is that correct? Yes. The night at David's apartment. All right. Now I'll tell you what I think. You are in deadly danger, Miss Davis. These beings want to claim you. So far, they have had no success. Only in the darkness do they have power. Little by little, step by step, they have been removing the obstacles in their way to reaching you. First your mother, and then your father, Miss Davis. Both died in the same fashion. In the darkness, death struck at them. Now tell me, do you feel their presence here in this room as I talk to you? Yes. Turn out the lights, Brian. <laughs> Stand by the switch, if you please, Brian. If anything happens, turn the lights back on. All right. Dr. Vesilius, I don't... Do you want me to continue working with you? Yes, sir. All right, then. Brian, turn off the lights. Yes, doctor. The room now is in darkness, Miss Davis. Do you feel or see anything? No, I... Yes. Yes, I do. Do you see anything? Yes. Doctor, I don't... Be quiet, you fool. I know what I'm doing. In front of me. The darkness gathering together into a huge, terrible... Not only do you see us, Miss Davis, but everyone else in the room also will see the vague shapes forming themselves in the blackness. We do not want you, Dr. Cecilius. The girl we want. We advise you to drop this case. You will only bring down the wrath of the shadow people upon your head. The girl. We want the girl to not stop us. Let us take her now. Turn on the light. They're gone. Miss Davis, are you all right? Yes. Yes, I am. Just as she said. The darkness. I, I saw it form into something, too. So did I. What are we going to do, Dr. Asilius? At the present moment, I don't know. But it's much I do know. You must leave this house immediately. You must try to get out of their reach. I don't know if that is possible. I hope it is. I shall have to return to my home. I must learn if there's some manner by which we can defeat these creatures. For the moment, leave this house. Dispose of it in any manner you may see fit. But leave this house. <laughs> Back now to our story, an original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled The Shadow People. We spent the night in my apartment, the three of us. The following day, Brian and Elaine made arrangements to dispose of the house. In the afternoon, Dr. Vesilius called me and asked that I come to see him. David, I'm glad you're here. Anything new, Doctor? Yes and no. You realize, of course, that this spiritual manifestation is not new. That it has gone on for centuries. No, I wasn't aware of that. It's true, David. De Maupassant wrote uh, what was supposedly a fiction story about the manifestation, David. He called it uh, the Orla. However, according to the information here on my desk, it was taken from an actual case history. Of course, he embroidered the story, added a few touches to something he didn't realize actually existed. But have you found anything with which we can fight them? Everything depends upon an answer I received from a colleague of mine in Paris, Dr. Henri Renault. I dispatched a telegram to him last night. Why hasn't he answered by now? There are certain things that must be done. It will take a few days, I'm afraid. We have to wait, David. There's nothing else we can do. In the next few days, the house was sold, and Brian and Elaine moved into a newer, more modern home a few miles from my apartment. Cecilia said it might take a few days for them to build up their power. I spent the night at the new house. The lights were left on, and I watched for any unusual occurrence. In the daytime, I'd return to my apartment and get some sleep. About four days after Elaine and Brian moved into the new house, I was at home when Hesibius phoned me. Hello? David? Yes, Dr. Hesibius? I hate to tell you this, David. What's the matter? What's wrong? They were a step ahead of me, David. I just received word that Renault died or was killed. 
At the very moment I sent the telegram to him. Step by step, they had outwitted us. For they had anticipated every move we'd make. Even Dr. Hesedius was at a loss as to what to do. He agreed to meet me at the Davis house. What did you want to see us about, Dr. Hesedius? Did you find out anything more? I'm sorry to say that I haven't. At the moment, I'm at a complete loss. I don't know what to do. But what did you want to see us about this evening? Merely to check, to see if anything else has happened. Miss Davis, have you seen or heard anything? Not in the house. Only in my dreams. Your dreams? Yes. When I go to sleep at night, in my dreams, in the darkness, I see them. And it's grown worse, much worse. I was hoping that it would not have progressed so far. There has been no disturbance in this house, but now they disturb your sleep, Miss Davis. Now... You must stay awake for as long as you can. I want the three of you to move into my house. Perhaps that will give you more protection. That night, we moved over to Vesuvius' house. Perhaps Elaine would have more protection there. From there, we might be able to devise some plan of action, some way to beat those beings. For a few days, things were quiet. The shadow people seemed to have withdrawn. For a while, I thought that we might have succeeded in thwarting their purpose. Elaine no longer complained of troubled sleep. But that condition lasted for a few days only. About ten days later, they made themselves known and felt again. That night, we were in the study. When suddenly Hesselius whirled around and... Elaine, what are you looking at? Outside the house. Right where the light leaves off, I see them. She's right, Dr. Hesselius. I can see them too. What should we do, Doctor? Nothing. What do you mean, nothing? There's nothing we can do. We can't just... We can't do anything, Brian. Don't you understand that they have us at their mercy? The greatest man in my field was Henri Renault. If he could do nothing against them, what do you think we can do? He's right, Brian. There's nothing we can do. As long as the house remains lighted... Just so long will they remain outside. If the lights were... <laughs> that sounds... The night father was killed. The same sound we heard, the same sound. The lights. What's happened to oh, the lights? Be quiet, please. I thought that this emergency... A candle. That's right, Miss Davis. As long as this burns, this one candle will be safe. For they cannot advance into the light. They are limited by the darkness. As long as the candle burns, they will have to remain outside of this room. <laughs> Around you, in every room of the house, in the darkness outside, we are around you. This time you shall not escape. This time we will claim you. Take it easy, Brian. I can't stand it. Brian, come back! Don't be a fool. I'm going after him. Stay here. We just can't let him he go. He won't have a chance. I doubt it. Will. <laughs> Miss Davis, I'm afraid that your brother is dead. <laughs> the wind, Doctor. Listen to the wind. I know. Yes, Doctor. Listen to the wind. By now that the three of you haven't a chance. You must know in your minds that we can destroy you at any moment we desire. But, Dr. Hesselius, you may still save your own life. Let the others go. Give them to us. No. No, you will have to take all of us. Shall we destroy your light? Shall we move? On you now. <laughs> as you will. Do as you will. Sorry, David. The candle is out. In the darkness. The figure is in the darkness. others 
are dead now. And we shall live on the earth. And man in the day shall not see us. They will know that we wait for our chance. That we walk with them. Only in the night, when the darkness grows together, and the forms of the shadow people are shaped from the blackness, will they see us. Then they will know that we are their companions. Look next to you. There in the shadows. <laughs> Tonight's tale of the unusual, the terrifying, the unknown. Join us again when next we journey down the corridor of the Hall of Fantasy to hear another strange tale of the supernatural. All characters and events portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves old-time radio or the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise you can find other podcasts that I host. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Retro Radio